The Hidden History of the Human Race, Part 4. You're listening to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. Here we go. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, angels and demons and monsters and serpents to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast, coming to you not live from the 10 by 10 by 10 by 10 by 10 Tangent Cube of Science. Nestled amongst the dusty bones of an ancient seabed high atop the Edwards Plateau. And uh, we got another trip next week. And are we still are we still arguing about whether we're going to do a show for that week? <laughs> like, okay, we had plans to do two shows this week so that there would be one to drop next week, but... Uh, an act God of, intervened. That's right. There was an act of God, a thunderstorm, that took place last night during our recording time, and that keeps us from recording because we don't want the all the equipment connected to power when lightning is happening. So we couldn't record last night, and tonight was the night for us doing the second show, so we're doing the this week's show on that night. So I just don't know if we're going to have a show next week. I, I don't think we will. That's my prediction. Uh, we're going to put up a best of show. Which is basically you just you just cruise back through your favorite episodes and <laughs> listen to a little bit of each one. <laughs> I was gonna say, are you gonna sit down and make one? No, no, no. no okay, no, no. This they is self-made, self-made, <laughs> best of. crowdsourced, best of. <laughs> cruise back through the archives and find your own best of shows. <laughs> yeah, it works really good. Yeah, uh, yeah. So you know, we feel kind of bad, but at the same time. For three years, we've put out one show a week without skipping, so we don't feel very bad. <laughs> uh, and yeah, we've we had to skip when I got sick. We tried. We went for a sh- we gave it a shot. Though. Yeah, we had to skip when I got sick, and we're gonna we're probably gonna have to skip next week as well. And we told you guys this, you know, long time ago in that first uh, commercial. We <laughs> That's promised right. that if you started donating to the pyramid scheme, you may not get an episode that week <laughs> because we might run off and do something with the money that you sent us. So. That's kind of what's happening. <laughs> yep. So yeah, next week is the Scablands. We'll be leaving. It's it's Thursday right now when we're recording, and we'll be leaving Monday morning. A very early Monday morning. The plane leaves at like six forty-five. Yep. And uh, should I be giving all these details? Am I going to get assassinated? <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. It leaves from Dallas at six forty-five in the morning. There I go. <laughs> it's not a big deal. That's, Nobody's going to care. About that's it. right. <laughs> <laughs> Yep, so our job is van drivers. Very important. Oh, wait, you are going to give a speech. What? Darren okay. said Darren said he got you to give a speech. Uh, yeah. Like it's a master of ceremonies at the beginning. <laughs> yeah. I asked him on the last call. I was like, wait, you got to kind of give I'm the, not. I'm not giving a speech. That's what he said. I guess you could call it a speech. Yeah. He was like, I'll, give Kyle, I'll get Kyle to do the opening remarks. I was like, wait, you got Kyle to do that? And he was like, well, do you want to do it? And I was like, no, no, that's good. Kyle's doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Yeah. Not much for public speaking, but uh, well, you were, can't you be were, there. You were on stage. I mean, you did rehearse play, lines. You did plays. Yeah. Yeah. Just totally rehearse your lines. I don't know what to say. I just get up there and make it up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, you did a good job last time. That was kind of impromptu. Oh, yeah. The, the, at the end of the yeah. thing? Yeah. Yeah. You did a good job. Well, thanks, man. Yeah. Yeah, so that's happening. It's going to be a week out in the Scamblads with Randall and Brad and, and uh, Dave Matheson and Brandon Powell. Is Powell going to be there? I don't think he's going to uh, be at this one. Is he not? Is he going to be at this one? Yeah, we're going to do breathwork. Yeah, work. he's going to be right. there. Okay, so yeah, we're going to have... Randall, of course, and we're going to be going all through Washington looking at the channeled scablands. And uh, and uh, Matheson will be there to do some star lore, and we will have one night of stargazing. And Powell will be there to do breathing exercises and maybe some polar dips. I don't know if that's going to happen this time. It was kind of impromptu. We found a place to get in the water uh, this last one, and we just did it. So yeah, maybe that'll happen again. And we are going to be at Soap Lake. Which, yeah, which reminds me, we got to be freezing. <laughs> we got to bring some swim trunks. Yeah, time. I brought some last time, but of course, did you get in your knickers? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I did. I brought Dave I and brought I got last in, time too. Dave yeah. and I got in our boxers because we, the hike we took at the end of it. That's where the I didn't bring them that day. I didn't know. Did you have a? Did you? Did, I'm gonna bring a butt flap. That's what. That's what we should have done. You're gonna wear butt. Flaps. <laughs> bring the butt flaps to do uh, yeah. the polar dip. Yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> 
Is that an Ouroboros? <laughs> Yes. Yeah. So I'm. I am feeling better, thanks to all the well wishes from everybody. Um, I still have a bit of a cough, but that's to be expected, being a smoker. But everything else is gone. The fever and the, you know, all the other stuff. So that's good. And uh, I want to talk about the emails real quick. I they keep coming in. I'm still sorting them. We have. I feel like there's a ton of them backed up, so we're going to have to do a communications that, episode. That was the plan, was to right. do a communications episode. Right, and I just Which still could happen, maybe. Maybe. Maybe, maybe. It could happen. So if there is an episode that will drop while we're gone, it will be a communications episode. I mean, I guess we could sit in here and read from this book for four hours, but I don't really want to do that. Yeah. Got to change it up. Yeah. Keep it exciting. Yeah. Sure. <clears throat> keep it exciting yeah so anyway just keep sending emails I really appreciate them I do read them all and we will get to them um, I am still marking them and stuff I know we haven't done any in a long time but yeah we're going to do a, an episode dedicated to that and that's probably how we're going to have to do it from from now from, from now on moving forward because I find that like if, if I'm trying to read just a couple uh, on each show you know two or three maybe which is what I can which is usually what we can get in on in the first segment but more than that are coming in, then what happens is I start getting behind and then I don't want to be reading a couple of ep a couple of emails from last month. Uh, I'd rather just attack, like tackle them all at once. Mm -hmm. And then for a while we can keep up. Yeah. yeah. And then we're eventually going to have to either stop or do an episode to catch all the way back up. Yeah. yeah. You know, because like we've gotten four or five this week that I would like to read, but I wouldn't be reading those. I'd be reading ones we got four or five weeks ago, mm -hmm. you know. So, I don't know. Maybe that makes sense. Maybe not. Anyway, let's do Space Weather News from spaceweather.com. I should have had it pulled up here. Oh, and the watcher says he will be here, but he was spaced out. Oh, crap. <laughs> Someone spaced him? <laughs> so, from spaceweather.com, CME mini impacts possible this week. The sun produced a flurry of CMEs on April 25th and 26th. None of them was Earth-directed, but... One or two might deliver glancing blows to Earth's magnetic field later this week. The most likely date of impact would be the 30th. Also, coming soon, a total eclipse of the moon. Mark your calendars. On May 26th, the full moon will pass through the shadow of Earth, producing a total lunar eclipse. For 14 and a half minutes, the disk of the moon will turn orange, the same color as the core of our planet's shadow. The eclipse will be visible from Antarctica, which is not helpful. Australia, parts of Asia, and the Americas. In the USA, the best, pl the best place to be is near the west coast, where the, where the eclipse will unfold in its entirety before sunrise. The low-hanging moon will look extra big and beautiful because the moon of the moon illusion. On the east coast, the eclipse will not be visible at all. And uh, current conditions, solar wind speed is 322.9 kilometers per second. The density is a high 12.1 protons per cubic centimeter. Uh, sunspot number right now is 42. And let's see, the neutron count is 10.1% above the space age average, which is rated as very high, because I think the highest is, was 11.7. So that's really high. And uh, KP index right now is 1%. And the 24-hour max for the KP was is two, both rated as quiet. So that is your space for the news for this week. Thank you, Russ. And I think Kyle is still trying to connect with the watcher. <clears throat> that's what happened. He's sending me messages. I totally missed the space for the news update <laughs> while I was doing all that stuff for the watcher. Okay, yeah, he says he's got hangouts up and running if we're ready. So yeah, I I, I set up Google Meet here so he could do that. We don't have to have the do 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 do. Okay. Do 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 do. <laughs> Do, 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 do. <laughs> Go on for yeah. five minutes. While he's not answering. While he, he doesn't us. answer the phone, even yeah. though he's saying he's right there. Right. Okay. So tell him to join. I told him to join the meeting. Okay. Uh, in any case, um, I have. You have stories? I have a story. <coughs> now, this is. Um, yeah, I think he just joined. Okay. This is a. Was It, it was in the New Yorker. And it's called. Uh, what is it called? It's called, it's a long story. The Challenges of Animal Translation. And the subheadline is, Artificial Intelligence May Help Us Decode Animalese. 
but how much will we really be able to understand? Ah, relearning the language of birds. Yes. So the premise is is pretty interesting. They, I, I don't want to read this story, the whole thing. I've got a little <laughs> segment, an excerpt here that I've uh, about Cephas. It's just really cool, but. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. They're 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 working on machine learning, using machine learning to to um, learn how to communicate with animals because they're they try to describe how the world that the animal exists in is so different. The concepts are so beyond what we can imagine. Yeah. That what what would they what would their language even be about what would it be made of in terms of little conceptual tidbits that they're putting together to mean stuff yeah it could possibly be so far outside our understanding that it makes it relatively just impossible for us to try to decode right what they're saying but that computers not having any of that bias or being bound by a worldview or anything like that could possibly achieve this okay and thus act as a middle, like a, an intermediary or what it, whatever the word is, yeah. uh, between us and the animals, right? Uh-huh. Kind of like what Google Translate does, right? What was the language, in the, the South American language uh, that Translate uses? Aymara. Aymara, exactly. Um, so it's sort of like a... Yeah, I, I see. I, I've also seen plenty of stories, you know, when you f- I follow some AI news, and uh-huh. a lot of them talk about how... How do we find out how much of our own biases are built into AI because they go into the initial program? Yeah, that's a problem. Yeah. So, I, you know, I'm the, not trying to skirt this idea. I'm just saying, like, yes, the computers... Well, ma- this article actually discusses a lot of the problems that we face in trying to do this. And okay. that's one of the main focuses. I mean, the focus of it is like, hey, is this a possible way that we could eventually figure it out? But they point out problem after problem after problem. That's okay. kind of what the article is doing. Okay. Uh, now, I read this while I was, you know, falling asleep last night, <laughs> so <laughs> I don't have perfect uh, memory of... of uh, yeah, for new listeners, a cepha is a cephalopod. Cephas? Cephas. That's right. That's right. So this is just... I've always been fascinated by cephalopods. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, just watching videos of them. And, you can tell and, that they hate us. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> They're mad. <laughs> I mean, I think that that's <laughs> kind of part of what this article is saying. Because, like, we look at them and we're like, they obviously want to kill everyone. <laughs> and that's probably not right. They're just biding their time. Actually. That's all it <laughs> yeah. is. But you can they tell that they're angry. They don't want to kill you <laughs> right now. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, with the cephalopods, as the article states, such as octopuses, which is, isn't that correct? Octopodes. I thought it was octopodes. octopodes. Come on. Octopodes. Yeah, octopuses and squid, the gap widens further. Our common ancestor with them is thought to be a flatworm with only the most rudimentary of nervous systems. Octopus brains are essentially a separate evolutionary experiment in developing intelligence. An octopus has around 500 million neurons in its body in the same range as a dog, but they are spread around mostly in the arms where they form clusters called ganglia connected to one another. Even the brain in the center of the body is bizarre because the creature's esophagus, through which food is ingested, runs right through the middle of it. <laughs> <laughs> that is really strange right there. This is why they want to eat us. Yeah, that's right. They, you know, want, this, this, they are going to consume our brains. <laughs> <laughs> How's it going, Watcher? You there? I, I hear can, you. I hear him. Oh, he's having network issues. Yeah. Okay. Uh... Some researchers hold that with this distributed nervous system, cephalopods might host a community of minds. (laughs) It isn't clear, for instance, whether it's the brain or the arms that decide what the arms do. That's crazy. The arms decide what the brain does. (laughs) The arms are in charge. (laughs) An octopus mind is nothing like a primate mind, nor indeed like a dog's, elephant's, or bat's mind. The evolutionary ethologist Phyllis Lee of the University of Stirling in Scotland has written. According to the Australian philosopher of mind, Peter Godfrey Smith, cephalopods are probably the closest we will come to meeting an intelligent alien. Yep. Some researchers still hesitate to attribute mind to octopuses at all. 
And yet their behavior is often indicative of memory, problem solving, cunning, personality, and even, some argue, sentience. They figure out how to unscrew jars, how to sabotage laboratory lights with jets of water. They may not like brightness. How to escape from their tanks just when their human wardens aren't looking. They appear to gather items sometimes not for any obvious use, but simply because they find them interesting. Some octopuses in captivity have been known to take what seems to be a dislike to individuals, <laughs> squirting them with water at every opportunity. They talk to you, reach out to you. Michael Kuba, a marine biologist who has worked at the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology in Japan, told me, but only to people they know. Octopuses seem to have designs of their own, which may subvert ours. Their agendas are often unfathomable. When I first saw octopuses play, Jennifer Mather, a professor at the University of Lethbridge in Alberta, Canada, who specializes in cephalopod behavior, said, I realized that we only saw it as play because it looked like our play. She instead describes such behavior as motivated by exploration and led by the question, what can I do with this object? And yet, an octopus might not even have an eye, as yes, in it's an clearly ego. we! <laughs> what can our arms do with this object? <laughs> Ultimately, Mather said, it's hard to know for sure what the actions mean, because we don't know where each one starts and finishes. We have no lexicon for translation. Mm. So it's cool. They go... They, in the article, they, you know, they talk about dolphins and the, the various techniques and things that, were, that have been used to uh, try to communicate with dolphins or decipher you know, what their possible language might be. Yeah. And there's just so many interesting little tidbits in this article. So if you get a chance, go check it out. The New Yorker. Uh, don't close it because if you try to go read it again, it will <laughs> tell you, you have to pay. <laughs> but it's called The Challenges of Animal Translation. And yeah, you know, by Philip Ball. Uh, I may have told this story on the podcast before, but one of my favorite because I've I've listened to and read quite a few um, stories from researchers who work in marine biology laboratories that keep cephalopods and study them, and the stories they tell about the things that these things do. You know, I mean, there was one researcher that was like, I came I came back to the lab one night having forgotten something. And he opens the door, and there's a couple of cephalopods walking down the hallway. <laughs> yeah, because they can walk. Yeah, you know, they can use they use arms on either side, and they can you know, four on one side, four <laughs> on the other, and they can walk on them. And he and like they all froze. You know, and the octopuses are like shit. <laughs> <laughs> we got caught. But the 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 best story was <clears throat> one of the. Uh, one of the big, they had a bunch of big tanks in there, and some of them had cephas in them, and other ones had other fish. And one of the tanks with the fish, like every day, they realized that there was like one less fish in the fish tank. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, they set up some cameras to figure out what was going on. And after everybody had gone home and all the lights were out, one of the cephalopods in one of its tanks, and now the tanks are sealed, right? But it had figured out that. It could. It, it actually dismantled the, um, the the pumping system from the inside of its tank. Started. It unscrewed things, pulled things apart, went out through the, the the line for the pump, and then somehow got the lid of it. Used that to get an arm out, and then undid the latch that opened the lid on its tank. And then gets out of its tank, opens the fish tank, gets one fish out, <laughs> and consumes the fish. <laughs> Closes the fish tank back up, and then gets back in its tank, and then seals the thing back up from the inside and puts the screws back in. Yeah, that's, that's pretty <laughs> awesome. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> <coughs> and they talk about how now, they, they talk about how they do these things where the, they had engineers, they would hire engineers to work for their labs to design puzzles for the food, right? So they would get, they would get an engineer to design some complicated, like a puzzle box, mm -hmm. you know, something you have to figure out how to open. Because you could give them something simple like a jar. You put the food in the jar and seal the jar and then put the jar in there and the octopus would look at it and it would eventually figure out how to get the food out. But they would, so they got more, they were doing more and more complicated things like that and they eventually hired like a mechanical engineer to design puzzle, boxes, puzzle yeah. boxes, you know, so that they could 
get the and these things would figure it out. How do you undo a you know a, um when you've got a you got a like a flathead screw, but it's countersunk. But these things can actually use one of the suckers in there and like unscrew the fucking yeah, screw. Yeah. <laughs> it's like really cool. <laughs> so, yeah, they're interesting. Yeah, but do they have a language? Do they talk to each other? That's a hard one. Well, uh, the language could be symbolism because they can yes. they can change their skin color and, and they can yeah, they so can create be... roughness on their skin and right. they have lights and they can they can they can strobe. Yeah, you know they they have ways of yeah. communicating. I don't I don't know if they have a voice, right? Per se, but but they could do semaphore like, you know, you got yeah. enough arms, you could make enough symbols out of your body to do you know like we could wave at each other. Yeah, we have a bunch of symbols that we do with our arms. So an octopus, I would assume, could they would be able to talk to each other using semaphore, right? Body language. Yeah, they could do that. Yeah. Now they did talk about how we taught uh, some. I don't know if it was monkeys or chimpanzees or whatever, some sign language yeah. in there. And there was one of them in particular knew quite a bit yeah. of sign language. But it was hard to tell if it, you know, it's like you teach your dog how to roll over. Well, if, if that was, uh, you know, a sign language sign, does the dog really know that? Mm. Yeah, You know, so that the point was, are we, are we just teaching it to, you know, do a... a a series of, of tasks and then get a response that they want. So they use it to get a response that they want. Yeah. Is that language? Right. Maybe it is. I don't know. It's, it's an interesting question. Yeah. Yeah. I think there was a, there was a, <laughs> a gorilla too that had sign language. They've taught. Maybe uh, that's what it was. Maybe yeah. it was the gorilla. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that's been replicated and yeah. Is it, is it really talking? Or has it learned that certain strings of finger movements will result in food, even if it doesn't know what those words right, are? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Because, like, I was going to even compare some of the stuff that they talk about, the cephalopods, like, <laughs> with a dog, right? A dog knows when you leave the house, and it knows now I can go get on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you yeah. know, yeah. they know that. And then yeah. when, if you come in the door and they jump off that couch and they're sitting there and they're kind of <laughs> looking, like, totally guilty of yeah. something. yeah. Or if they broke into the trash while you were gone, and right. they know they're not supposed to do it. Right. You know, it's an act of defiance. Right, but they don't have <laughs> they don't have quite enough to know that they should get off the couch before you're going to get home, so it's not warm anymore, and then get the hair off the couch too, <laughs> yeah, so that yes. they can't tell. Right, to sort of pat it down and make sure it doesn't look like the dog's laying there. Right, because like you come in, and even if the dog's not on the couch, you see a dog shaped spot with a bunch yeah. of hair. You know the dog was on the couch. Right. Yeah. So do they they do they have enough capacity to, could they learn that that's what they need to do? You know, I don't know. I don't know. That yeah. kind of problem solving is, I don't know. That, that's, that requires like a lot of thinking ahead. But they do seem to do some of that when they're, you know, doing dog things like hunting. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't know. Um, but did they say anything in that article about learning how to speak whale? <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember. Might have fallen asleep for that part. <laughs> it's an incredibly good article. Fell asleep only like four times. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, we have some a few minutes left. Should we go ahead and dive into the book? Yeah. So uh, last week we... Uh, let's see, what case was this? The guy was, his name was, um, <clears throat> Verwern or, yeah. And they were from, they were, these were tools from France and he had, he had, uh, come up with a evidence of work, uh, list that was like, number one, signs of percussion resulting from the primary blow that detached the flake from the flint core. Two, signs of percussion resulting from secondary edge chipping of the flake itself. And three, signs of use on the working edges. That was his. And he said that you needed more than one of those things. That's right. On any given artifact. Uh, and then he gives some examples on how he would apply this, uh, which we went through. <laughs> And then he talked about the finds he had found a bunch of scrapers and other types of tools and it, and that that uh by his definition they did they were tools. 
Um, right, and that was in the, what, it was like three million years ago or something? Yeah. What, what was it? Yeah, let's see. I don't remember what the... Or maybe it was up to 10. Yeah. It was in the middle of something, and it was... I need to pull up that chart. Yeah. Yeah, it was like... But yeah, he's, he adopted uncovered tools for hammering, hacking, and digging, uh, large pointed tools for chopping and digging, and... Um, yeah, so he included. He concluded at the end of the Miocene, there was here a culture which was, as we can see from its flint tools, not in the very beginning phases, but had already proceeded through a long period of, develop, of development. This population knew how to flake and work flint. And he went on to say, the size of the implement point, implements points toward a being with a hand of the same size and shape as our own, and therefore a similar body. The existence of large scrapers and choppers that fill our own hands, and above all, the perfect <laughs> adaptation to the hand found in... Perfect adaptation to the hand found in almost all the tools seems to verify this conclusion in the highest degree. Tools of uh, the most different sizes, which show with perfect clarity useful edges, use marks, and hand grips, lie for the most part so naturally and comfortably in our hands, with the original sharp points and edges intentionally removed from the places where a hand would grasp, that one would think the tools were made directly for our hands. And then he said about the toolmakers, while it is possible that this tertiary form might possibly have stood closer to the animal ancestors of modern humans than do modern humans themselves, who can say to us that they were not already of the same basic physical character as modern humans, that the de development of specific, specifically human features did not extend back into the late Miocene? So that was the time period. Which would be yeah. that's right. That's the ten from uh, at least back to around ten thousand or ten million years. Yeah, ten thousand years. As we explain in chapter seven, fossil skeletal remain remains indistinguishable from those of fully modern humans have been found in the Pliocene, Miocene, Eocene, and even earlier. When we also consider that humans living today make implements not much different from those taken from Miocene beds in France and elsewhere, then the, val the validity of the standard sequence of human evolution begins to seem tenuous. In fact, the standard sequence only makes sense when a lot of very good evidence is ignored. When all the available evidence, implemental and skeletal, is considered, it is quite difficult to construct any kind of evolutionary sequence. What we are left with is the supposition that there have been various types of human and human-like beings living at the same time and manufacturing stone tools of various levels of sophistication for tens of millions of years into the past. As late as 1924, George Grant McCurdy, director of the American School of Prehistoric Research in Europe, reported positively in Natural History about the flint implements of Ariac which is the place in France. Uh, similar tools have been found in England, and some critics argued that natural forces, such as movements of the earth, had fla fractured flints by pressure, thus creating stone objects resembling tools. But scientists showed that in the particular locations where Moore's flint tools were found in England, the geological evidence did not suggest the operation of such natural causes. That would be the Red Crag area. Mm. Remember, he was saying there are such delicate shells also in there that if geological forces had been shoving the flints against stuff, the shells would all be busted as well. But the, even, right. even the hinges of the shells were still together. That's right. Yeah, that was a good point. McCurdy wrote, Conditions favoring the play of natural forces do not exist in certain Pliocene deposits of East Anglia, where J. Reed Moyer has found worked flints. Can the same be said of the chipped flints from upper Miocene deposits near Ariac? Uh, Solus and Capitan have both recently answered in the affirmative. Capitan finds not only flint chips that suggest utilization, but true types of instruments which would be considered as characteristic of certain Paleolithic horizons. These not only occur, but reoccur. Punches, bulbed flakes, carefully retouched to form points and scrapers of the Mousterian type. Discs with borders retouched in a regular manner, scratchers of various forms, and, finally, picks. He concludes that there is a complete similitude between many of the chipped flints from Cantal and the classic specimens from the best-known Paleolithic sites. William Solis held the chair of geology at Oxford, and Louis Capitan, a highly respected French anthropologist, was professor at the College of France. Okay, so now we're going to Belgium. Discoveries by A. Ruto. 
In, Bel- in Belgium, A. Ruto, conservator of the Royal Museum of Natural History in Brussels, made a series of discoveries that brought anomalous stone tool industries into new prominence during the early 20th century. Most of the industries identified by Ruto dated to the early Pleistocene. But in 1907, Ruto's ongoing research resulted in more startling finds in sand pits near Boncel in the Ardennes region of Belgium. The tool-bearing layers were oligocene, which means that they were from 25 to 38 million years old. Is that what our chart says? Oligocene. Um, it's... 33 yeah. to 23. Yeah, okay, so that's close. <laughs> yeah. The same there. And, uh, oh, I see we're already at the break. Uh, well, let me finish this one part. Describing the tools, George Schweinfurth wrote... Among them were choppers, anvil stones, knives, scrapers, borers, and throwing stones, all displaying clear signs of intentional work that produced forms exquisitely adapted for use by the human hand. The fortunate discoverer had the pleasure to show the sites to 34 Belgian geologists and students of prehistory. They all agreed that there could be no doubt about the position of the finds. Hmm. All right. There you have it. Break time. Executing all technical difficulties flawlessly with zero mistakes and zero ends. Zero edits. At the beginning of each segment. <laughs> Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. Oh, oh zero ends? Zero ends. Okay. No end. No end. And zero edits, right? Yeah. Nothing is ever cut out of this show. Of course. <laughs> but... Uh, we still have also uh, donations rolling in with notes. Yeah. So when we do that communications bonus note, I'll be reading those. All right. Much appreciated to everybody who's donating. Yeah. And the watcher is here now. That's right. Yeah. Did you want to come on and say what's up or are, are, are there They're like screaming. minions yelling in the background? <laughs> minions. <laughs> <laughs> well, hold on. Don't don't do it until I hit record on your mic. <laughs> okay. Now you can. <laughs> Yeah, I still don't want to say what's up, but what's up? Oh, I wish I had Randall's uh, answer to that question. Oh, yeah, the, the inverse of the sum of all something Somethings forces. or other whatever. <laughs> blah, blah. Yeah, how's it going? How about that? Yeah. Ah, pretty good. Glad to be here. Sorry for the network issues. I know that it uh, created no problems. Oh, there's the bag of chips. Ah, the bag is back. <laughs> That's because nice it was warm. actually a plastic bag. It's in my hand. <laughs> Nah, well, yeah, whatever. Right. Yeah. yeah. You sleep in one of those things. I know you oh, yeah. do. It's, he definitely sleeps in one of those emergency. Yeah, it gave the sleeping bag to Brad intact. <laughs> Floating in a chip bag. <laughs> high above the flat world. <laughs> it's good to have you here, buddy. Now, mute your mic. All right, let's go. All right. Okay. Ruteau's complete report on the Boncel finds appeared in the Bulletin of the Belgian Society for Geology, Paleontology, and Hydrology. Ruteau also said that stone tools look like uh, those of Boncel. Stone tools like those of Boncel have been found in Oligocene contexts in other pl- in other places and at the cavern at Bay Bonnet uh, at Rosart on the left bank of the. 
Wow, lots of names here. The Muse stone tools had also been found in a middle Pli- Pliocene context. Context. Now it appears, wrote Ruto, that the notion of the existence of humanity in the Oligocene has been affirmed with such force and precision that one cannot detect the slightest fault. He noted that the Oligocene tools almost exactly resembled tools made within the past few centuries by the native inhabitants of Tasmania. He then described in detail the various types of tools from the Oligocene. These included... Plain choppers, sharpened choppers, pointed choppers, and retouchers, which were used to resharpen the working edges of other stone implements. Uh, We find ourselves, he says, confronted with a grave problem. The existence in the Oligocene of beings intelligent enough to manufacture and use definite and a variety of types of implements. Today, scientists do not give any consideration at all to the possibility of a human or even proto-human presence in the Oligocene. We believe there are two reasons for this. Unfamiliarity with, the ev- with evidence such as Ruto's and unquestioning faith in currently held views on human origins and antiquity. Okay, discoveries by Frudenberg near Antwerp. In February and March of 1918, Wilhelm Frudenberg, a geologist attached to the German army, was conducting test borings for military purposes in tertiary formations west west of Antwerp in Belgium. In clay pits at Hole, (laughs) near St. Gillis, Gillis, and at other locations, uh, Frudenberg discovered flint objects he believed to be implements along with cut bones and shells. Most of the objects came from sedimentary deposits, of the Scaldizian marine stage. The Scaldizian spans the early Pliocene and late Miocene and is thus four to seven million years old. Frudenberg suggested that the objects he discovered may have dated to the period just before the Scaldizian marine transgression, which, if true, would give them an age of at least seven million years. So yeah, I didn't look up what that is, the Scaldizian marine transgression. It sounds like an ocean... Uh, influx, but I don't know. Mm. But yeah, see, so he's found these shells and they have these cut marks. You see that notch? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, Frudenberg believes some of the flint implements he found had been used to open shells. Many of these were found along with cut shells and burned flints, which he took as evidence that intelligent beings had used fire during the tertiary. Concerning the cut shells, he stated... I found many intentional incisions, mostly on the rear part of the shells, quite near the hinge. He said the incisions were such as could only have been made with a sharp instrument. Some of the shells also bore puncture marks. In addition to cut shells, he also found bones of marine mammals bearing what he thought were cut marks. He carefully considered and rejected alternative hypotheses such as chemical corrosion or geological abrasion. He also found bones bearing deep impact marks that could have been made by stone hammers. Further confirmation of a human presence came in the form of a partial footprint or partial footprints apparently made when human-like feet compressed pieces of clay. From a clay pit, Frudenberg discovered one impression of the ball of a foot and four impressions of toes. According to him, patterns of ridges and pores matched those of human feet and were distinct from those of apes. So I guess the impressions were good enough to see uh, like skin prints. Wow. Frudenberg was an evolutionist and believed that his tertiary man must have been a small hominid displaying in addition to its human-like feet a combination of ape-like and human features. Altogether, Frudenberg's description of his Flemish tertiary man seems reminiscent of Australopithecus. But one would not, according to current paleoanthropological doctrine, expect to find any Australopithecines in Belgium during the late Miocene, over 7 million years ago. The oldest Australopithecines date back only about 4 million years in Africa. So then who made the footprints discovered by Frudenberg? There are today in Africa and the Philippines pygmy tribes with adult males standing less than 5 feet tall and females even shorter. The proposal that a small human being rather than an Australopithecine made the footprints is more consistent with the whole spectrum of evidence, stone tools, incised bones, isolated signs of fire, 
and artificially open shells. Australopithecines are not known to have manufactured stone tools or to have used fire. <coughs> okay, stone tools from Burma. In 1894 and 1895, scientific journals announced the discovery of worked flints in Miocene formations in Burma, then part of British India. The implements were reported by Fritz Noetling, a paleontologist who directed the Geological Survey of India. While collecting fossils, he noticed a rectangular flint object, and he said its implement-like form was difficult to explain by natural causes. Noetling noted, The shape of this specimen reminds me very much of the chipped flint described in Volume 1 of the Records, Geological Survey of India, and discovered in the Pleistocene of the, of the Nerbuda River, the artificial origin of which nobody seems to have ever doubted. He searched further and found about a dozen more chipped pieces of flint. How certain was the stratigraphic position of these flints? Noteling offered this account. The exact spot where the flints were found is situated on the steep eastern slope of a ravine, high above its bottom, but below the edge in such a position that it is inconceivable how the flints should have been brought there by any foreign agency. Uh, there is no room for any dwelling place in this narrow gorge, nor was there ever any. It is further impossible from the way in which the flints were found that they could have been brought to that place by a flood. If I weigh all the evidence, quite apart from the fact that I actually dug them out of the bed, it is my strong belief that they were in situ when found. So there was a, a narrow gorge and they were um, they were near to the top, stuck in the wall, I think is what he's saying. And he had to pry them out of the <clears throat> uh, so it's weird how why he thinks I don't understand how they couldn't have been brought there by a flood I don't know I mean unless it was a flood that put down all the sediments that made up the walls of the gorge right yeah but if they were near the top it just could have been a more recent one yeah right. or wait is the well okay if the gorge is really old yeah are you saying a flood that jammed them into the wall of the yeah, gorge? Yeah, that's what he's talking about, I think. He said it was situated on the steep eastern slope of a ravine high above its bottom, but below the edge, in such a position that it is inconceivable how the flint should have been brought there by any foreign agency. There is no room for any dwelling place. So, in other words, nobody carried it there. Right, right. right. Uh, there's no room for any dwelling place, nor was there ever any, so nobody's lived down in there. And it is further impossible from the way in which the flints were found that they could have been brought to that place by a flood. So I'm trying to imagine what he means by that. Like, were they dropped there when that was a, the ground surface and then it kept d being deposited on top of them and then and the then ravine gorge was cut? Was cut. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what I think. Okay. That's, that must be what he's saying. Yeah. Uh, marine, okay, a watcher says a marine transgression is a flood or tidal wave dropping a ton of non-native sediment. Interesting. So... Uh, okay, so in conclusion, Notling said, if flints of this shape can be produced by natural causes, a good many chipped flints, hitherto considered as undoubtedly artificial, products are open to grave doubts as to their origin. Which is another thing that's pointed out. Like, if you're gonna, he's like, if you're gonna say that this is not human work, then uh, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that everybody thinks is human work that we're gonna have to discard. Yeah. Okay, tools from Black Fork, Black's Fork River in Wyoming. In 1932, Edison Lohr and Harold Dunning, two amateur archaeologists, found many stone tools on the high terraces of the Black's Fork River in Wyoming. The implements appeared to be of Middle Pleistocene age, which would be anomalous for North America. Lohr and Dunning showed the tools they collected to E.B. Renaud, a professor of anthropology at the University of Denver. Renaud, who was, the, was also director of the Archaeological Survey of the High Western Plains, then organized an expedition to the region where the tools were found. During the summer of 1933, Renaud's party collected specimens from the ancient river terraces between the towns of Granger and Lyman. Among the specimens were crude hand axes and other flaked implements of a kind frequently attributed to Homo erectus, who is said to have inhabited Europe in the Middle Pleistocene. The reaction from, anth from anthropologists in America was negative. Renaud wrote in 1938 that his report had been harshly criticized by one of the irreconcilable opponents of the antiquity of man in America who had seen neither the sites nor the specimens. 
<laughs> Classic. Yeah, so the the one of the authorities on a, the antiquity of men in America criticized criticized his report, even though he had seen neither the specimens nor the site where they were found. Yep. <laughs> In response, Renaud mounted three more expeditions, collecting more tools. Although many experts from outside America agreed with him that the tools represented a genuine industry, American scientists have continued their opposition to the present day. The most common reaction is to say the crude specimens are blanks, which are unworked flakes, dropped fairly recently by Indian toolmakers. But Herbert L. Minshall, a collector of stone tools, stated in 1989 that the tools show heavy stream abrasion, even though they are fixed in desert pavements on ancient floodplain surfaces that could not have had streams for over 150,000 years. Hmm. If I did not realize that was what a blank was because we've been using that term for a long time, but that... Yeah, it seems like they're using it differently here. Unworked flakes is what they're calling a blank. Yeah, that's not what we... So we're misnaming... Yeah. Because a blank was like... The, this idea that you would, you you take a core or you know like a big nodule and you'd work it down, kind of thin it down a little bit, but it's big enough to where you could turn it into any kind of yeah. arrowhead or tool that yeah, you wanted. Yeah, but it's been chipped and you know, all you know. Yeah, it's yeah. been it's been even thinned. Right. You know. Yeah. So. Yeah. So that's not what that's not what that is. Yeah. And then I've also heard preform. Right. Yeah. So that's pre. It's final form, right? Right, but it's it's been worked all the way around. So yeah. that's probably a more proper name, appropriate name for what we've been finding. Yeah, preforms. If found at a site of similar age in Africa or Europe or China, stone tools like those found by Renaud would not be a source of controversy. But their presence in Wyoming is certainly very much unexpected at 150,000 or more years ago. The view now dominant is that humans entered North America not earlier than about 30,000 years ago at most. And before that, there was no migration of any other hominid. It's crazy. Like, if you think about that, that they, you know, that no hominids of any kind were ever in the Americas until 30,000 years ago. It's ridiculous. Yeah, me. it seems wild. That America had tons of animal species, but never any hominids until 30,000 <laughs> years ago. <laughs> Some suggested that the abrasion on the implements was the result of wind-blown sand rather than water. In reply, Minshall observed, These specimens were abraded on all sides, top and bottom, ventral and dorsal surfaces equally. That is extremely unlikely for wind-blown dust to achieve on heavy stone tools lying in heavy gravel but expectable on objects subjected to surf or heavy stream action. Minshall also noted that the tools were covered with a thick mineral coating of desert varnish, which takes this varnish, which takes a long time to accumulate, was thicker than on tools found on lower and hence more recent terraces in the same region. Yeah, to think about this, uh, this, the possibility of this cataclysm. Well, we know that, you know, the, the ice sheets melted quickly. Giant floods everywhere, right? Yeah. Wiped out the Colorado Plateau. And, you know, that was roughly 12, 13,000 years ago. Yeah. Somewhere around that time. Meltwater Pulse 1B. But it's, you know, it's wiping away sediments that are from that period to possibly millions of years in oh, the yeah. past. Oh yeah. So the fact that they don't that that it was assumed that people didn't arrive here until around, you know, just maybe just before that or something like that. Yeah, it's just like, before 1A. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's kind of understandable that because we don't find the stuff that's older than that. Mm. Well, it's been washed away. Yeah. Like it would have been like if it was the last Million years, right? The, the whole last million years of sediment it, that, that had been put down in the floodplains, where people would live, where hominids would live. Yeah, they'd stop digging at 12,000 years. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, 
if, I'm if saying, it's down there, they would just stop digging. No, what they I, know that that's the yeah, but what I'm saying is that the, the last million years of sediment that would have been laid down in the floodplains near near water, oh yeah, it's near gone. bodies of water, is gone. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So of course we don't find any, you know it's like we, yeah it's been washed into other places and completely stirred up yeah yeah and in so many cases just just pulverized yeah yeah so I mean we do find Clovis sites you know that that is interesting you know, yeah they're, they're still we can find them they've been buried and they're in places where it seems like they used to be habitable but now they're almost not they're like desert yeah, yeah. and they've been buried in like yeah. Huge right. loads of sediment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's not funny. It's just a quote. <laughs> the quote is funny. Yeah. Um Yeah, so it's it's just it's just weird to think about that, you know. That that the flood was washing away millions of years of evidence. Yeah. Yeah. In some cases. Yep. And even if it washed away only 50,000 years of, of, of evidence. That's still a lot. Yeah. And we had two of them in a succession, one yeah. A and one B. So the first one washes away, you know, hundreds of thousands of years. And the next one washes away, whatever that one left, plus another couple of hundred thousand or years. anything that was able to build up on top of what the, the yeah. aftermath of the other one was then washed away again. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But in some cases not. So you have, you have a place where maybe 1A, the, the, the melt pulse 1A washed away all this stuff and then new, like, a, like the Clovis yeah. culture came and built stuff on top of it. Yeah. Then 1B happens. Yeah. And doesn't wash that away. So we find it. Yeah. And there's nothing below it. Yeah. Yep. Even though that might have been a habitable site before 1A. Before 1A, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Some suggested, uh, wait, did I read that? Yeah, okay. I wanted to point out, though, he said the var- the desert varnish that was on these things, which takes a long time to accumulate, was thicker than that found on tools on lower and hence more recent terraces in the same region. That confused me at first, but then I realized it's the r- erosion that's recent. The terraces, yeah. Yeah. The, the, the layers that make up the terraces are older because they're down lower. Right. But they're more recently exposed. Yeah. That's what he that's what he meant. So because we're talking about building up of the desert varnish. Yeah, the on erosion. Te- right. The lower terraces have been more recently exposed and have thus have less desert varnish, even though they're older material. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. The cumulative evidence appears to rule out the suggestion that the implements discovered by Renaud were plank bore blanks dropped fairly recently on the high desert floodplain terraces. But Minshall noted. The reaction of American scientists to Renaud's interpretation of the Black's Fork collections as evidences of great antiquity was, and has continued to be for over half a century, one of general skepticism and disbelief, even though probably not one in a thousand archaeologists has visited the site nor seen the artifacts. Now that I can understand. The numbers there, like not one in a thousand archaeologists has visited the site or seen the ark. Not everybody can go look, right? But if all thousand of those people are still talking shit, then there's a problem. And that's <laughs> that's what he's saying, yeah. right? According to Minch, all the tools found by Renaud were the work of <laughs> Homo erectus, who may have entered North America during a time of lowered sea levels in the middle Pleistocene. Minshaw believed this was also true of stone tools found at other locations of similar age, such as Calico and his own excavation at Buchanan Canyon, both in Southern California. Minshaw was, however, skeptical of another Middle Pleistocene site. In January of 1990, Minshaw told one of us that he was not inclined to accept as genuine the technologically advanced stone tools found at Huitlaco in Mexico. The advanced stone tools found at Huitlaco were a characteristic of Homo sapiens sapiens and were thus not easy to attribute to Homo erectus. Minshall's response to Huitlaco was to suggest, without supporting evidence, that the stratigraphy had been misinterpreted and that the animal bones used to date the site, as well as the sophisticated stone artifacts, had been washed onto the site from different sources. This shows that researchers who accept some anomalies may rule out others using the double standard method. <laughs> Double standard method. <laughs> 
Works every time. Yeah, it does. Again and again. <laughs> and again. <laughs> All right. Advanced paleoliths, paleoliths and neoliths. Advanced paleoliths are more finely worked than the crude paleoliths, but industries containing advanced paleoliths may also contain cruder tools. We should first discuss the discoveries of Florentino and Megano, as well as the attacks upon them by Alice Herdlicka and W.H. Holmes. Next, we shall consider the finds of Carlos and Megano, which provide some of the most solid and convincing evidence for a fully human presence in the Pliocene. And we shall then proceed to anomalous finds made at sites in North America, including Weatlico, Mexico, Sandia Cave, New Mexico, uh, Shegianda, Ontario, Louisville, Texas, and Timlin in New York. And we shall conclude with the Neolithic finds from tertiary gold-bearing gravels of the California Gold Rush country. All right. All right the discoveries of Florentino Amegano in Argentina. Uh, during the late 19th century... Florentino thoroughly investigated the geology and fossils of the coastal provinces of Argentina, thereby gaining an international reputation. Amegano's controversial discoveries of stone implements, carved bones, and other signs of a human presence in Argentina during the Pliocene, Miocene, and earlier periods served to increase his worldwide fame. In 1887, Florentino made some significant discoveries at Monte Hermoso on the coast of Argentina, about 37 miles northeast of Bahia Blanca. Summarizing the Monte Hermoso evidence, he said... The presence of man, or rather his precursor, at this ancient site is demonstrated by the presence of crudely worked flints like those of the Miocene of Portugal, carved bones, burned bones, and burned earth proceeding from ancient fireplaces. The layers containing this evidence are in the Pliocene Monte Hermosan formation, which is about 3.5 million years old. Among the fossils recovered from Monte Hermoso was a hominid atlas the first bone of the spinal column at the base of the skull. Amegano thought it displayed primitive features, but A. Herdlicka judged it to be fully human, and this strongly suggests that beings of the modern human type were responsible for the artifacts and the signs of fire discovered at the Monte Hermosan formation. So that's weird because uh, the Herdlicka guy, he was the Smithsonian director, and he was the one that fought really hard against the... Uh, I mean, they for a while, it was like 5,000 years ago was when the first people showed up here. Mm -hmm. Amegano's discoveries at Monte Hermoso and elsewhere in the tertiary formations of Argentina attracted the interest of several European scientists. Alice Herdlicka, Herdlicka an anthropologist at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C., also took great, though unsympathetic, interest in Amegano's discovery. He found the degree of support they enjoyed among professional scientists, particularly in Europe, dismaying. In addition to being opposed to the existence of tertiary humans, Herdlicka was also extremely hostile to any reports of a human presence in the Americas earlier than a few thousand years before the present. After building an immense reputation by discrediting, with questionable arguments, all such reports from North America, he then turned his attention to the much-discussed South American discoveries of Florentino Amegano. In 1910, Herdlicka visited Argentina, and Florentino Amegano himself accompanied him to Monte Hermoso. Herdlicka also took an interesting approach to the discoveries that were made at that site. In his book, Early Man in South America, which was published in 1912, Herdlicka briefly mentioned the stone implements and other signs of human occupation uncovered by Amegano in the Monte Hermoso information. Strangely, he did not directly dispute them. Instead, he devotes dozens of pages to casting doubt on subsequent and less convincing discoveries that he and Amegano made in the uh, Puelchen, or a more recent formation overlying the Pliocene Monte Hermosan at Monte Hermoso. The Puelchen formation is about one to two million years old. So apparently, Erdlicka believed his lengthy refutation of the finds from the Puelchian formation was sufficient to discredit the finds in the far older Monte Hermosan formation at the same site. This tactic is often used to cast doubt on anomalous discoveries, criticize the weakest evidence in detail, and ignore the strongest evidence as much as possible. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, there is much evidence to suggest that the Puelchian finds, as well as the Monte Hermosan finds, were genuine. Most of the tools discovered by Herdlicka and Amegano during their joint expedition were roughly chipped from quartzite pebbles. 
Herdlicka did not dispute the human manufacture of even the crudest specimens. Instead, he questioned the ages. He suggested that the layer containing them was recent. In making this judgment, Herdlicka relied heavily on the testimony of Bailey Willis, the American geologist who accompanied him. Testimony. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Well, he did invite the guy to come with him, so that's at least better than nothing, right? It's not a geologist who's not there. Yeah. <laughs> the layer but can you talk about, you know, people. But it's interesting. He decides, he decides like number one. So, so Omegano d- discovers these things in the Monohumorosan formation, which is deep. Okay. Then Alice Herdlicka decides, I'm going to go down there and look at this because I don't like these discoveries because they're too old. He gets a geologist who he knows is a scurptard like he is and brings the guy down there. And then they don't look in that formation. They look at a more recent layer, the Puelchin. They find artifacts in there. The tools are so well made that he can't say they're not tools. So he gets the geologist to argue that this layer is not that old or mm-hmm. that the tools were not part of the original de- deposition. Yeah. And he doesn't even address the older stuff down deeper because actually the deposition or the arguments the geologist was making to make that layer not that old didn't work on the one below it. Yeah. It's like... <laughs> This classic script art. Okay. The layer containing the tools was at the top of the Puelchian formation. With some hesitation, Willis accepted the Puelchian as being at least Pliocene in age. He said it consisted of stratified, slightly indurated gray sands or sandstone, marked by very striking cross stratification and uniformity of gray color and grain. Willis described the topmost layer, apparently included by Emegano in the Puelchian formation, as a band about 6 to 16 inches thick, composed of gray sand, angular pieces of gray sandstone and pebbles, and some which were fractured by man. Willis remarked that the top layer of gray implement-bearing sand is identical in constitution to the lower layers of the Puelchian, but is separated from them by an unconformity by erosion. An unconformity is a lack of continuity in deposition between strata in contact with each other, corresponding to a period of non-deposition, weathering, or, as in this case, erosion. For judging how much time might have passed between the deposition of the formations lying above and below the line of unconformity, the surest indicator is animal fossils. (laughs) What fossils? Animal fossils. Oh, animal. Yeah. But how are those a good indicator? Because in other places you can date the fossils by the strata that they're in. So in this place, you can date the strata by the fossils that they're that are in it, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Willis, however, did not mention any of these animal fossils. It is thus unclear how much time might be represented by the unconformity. It could have been very short, making the layers above and below the unconformity roughly the same age, about one to two million years old. Attempting to eliminate this alternative, Willis wrote... Hand-chipped stones associated with the sands would mark them as recent. Willis assumed that any stone tools had to be recent and that the layer in which they were found, therefore, also had to be recent. It would appear, however, that the implement bearing gray gravelly sand may actually belong to the Puelchian formation, as Omegano believed, and that the stone implements found there could be as much as two million years old. So that's it. You bring a geologist with you who is willing to say that if there's stone tools in there, it has to be recent. Yeah, I mean, (laughs) right. (laughs) Relative dating. Yeah, and he's, right, it's bad for the gene pool. It's bad for the gene pool. And he says... (laughs) (laughs) And he says that the unconformity is the, you know, so he's like, see, there's an unconformity here between the deeper Puelchian and 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 the late Puelchian. And that unconformity means that the late is actually just a recent deposition. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know anything about it. Wouldn't I, I couldn't argue it. Uh, yeah, and I think what they're saying is you can't argue that way either. They're saying that the when, when you have an unconformity, the only way, well, well, at least at the time of writing this book, the best way that scientists have used to determine if there's a big difference in ages from from below and above the unconformity is to look at the fo- kinds of fossils you find in there. But there aren't any in this material. So you can't do that. So it could be really far apart. The unconformity could re- represent 
an enormous amount of time. Or it might represent a very short amount of time. Mm -hmm. But the geologist is saying that because the upper Puelkin, the late material above the unconformity, has tools in it, it must be much, much later than the lower, the, the early Puelkin formation, which they do date at like one to two million years. Huh. So Emegano also found stone tools along with cut bones and signs of fire in the Santa Crucian and uh, Entrerin formations in Argentina. The Santa Crucian formation is of early and middle Miocene age, making the tools found therein 15 to 25 million years old. We have not encountered any mention of the Entrerin in the current literature we have examined, but since this formation comes f before the Monte Hermosan, it would be at least late Miocene, which makes it over 5 million years old. In many places, Omegano found evidence of fires much hotter than campfires or grass fires. This evidence included large, thick pieces of hard, burned clay and slag. It mm. is possible these may represent the remains of primitive foundries or kilns used by the Pliocene inhabitants of Argentina. Now, that's... Wow, that's, that's cool. Because <laughs> that makes them even more advanced, right? Could be fireballs from I know. Heaven. I was also thinking that, too. It could be, uh, could be something else. Ball lightning? <laughs> Chinese lanterns. That's right. That's the explanation. <laughs> All right, I think it's break time. I'm sorry. For Lots what? of things have been distracting me through this segment. My, <laughs> I feel bad. It's been hard to What's follow. What's distracting you? Well, the watcher oh, is writing up, a whole bunch of stuff. Shut up, watcher. No, Jesus it's not. Christ. It's, it's not all his fault. I kept going off in like tangents in my brain, and I was thinking about. Well, bring them up. You know? Yeah, I probably should. Yeah. That's the point. Some of them were like way off. <laughs> <laughs> so what? Okay. We've already determined this is going to be like a 30 part series. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I can't math. All right. Next! All right. Happy birthday, Snake Wife. Oh, yeah. I just had to get that in there. Sorry yeah, to interrupt yeah. no, your uh, intro, but yeah, yeah but, but, <laughs> she's down at the beach, so you're having a good time down there. Yeah. For her birthday. And today is actually her birthday. No, it is today. Yeah. It is today. And I wanted to make sure we said it on the show. Okay. And I and then that was another thing. You used your freaking intro to do that. I didn't want it, because what if I <laughs> forgot? <laughs> <laughs> this is one happy of the other birthday. things that distracted me. <laughs> what did you say? He said happy birthday. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I was going to do an intro about how you weren't listening to me reading and stuff. But yeah. No, that's fine. Watcher shows up. Happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> that is exactly what it sounded like. <laughs> well, I'm sorry I ruined your intro and the last segment. Yeah. You Kyle can take mine. Kyle's over there freaking counting the stitching on his jeans or something <laughs> while I'm trying to read. I'm like... <laughs> No, I was thinking of things like, <gasps> I forgot to mention Laura's birthday in the beginning. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And I mean, I didn't, I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff I forgot. I didn't do the crypto update and uh, we didn't do the agricultural update, which there is. See isn't. what happens when we take breaks? Yeah. When we don't do a show every week, we get rusty. <laughs> I know. Like real quick. <laughs> we did do a show last week. <laughs> it's already rusty. <laughs> Well, just remind me to pull up the crypto information at the end of the show. Okay. If we can, <laughs> yeah, if we can remember. Yeah. <laughs> Watcher. <laughs> this is why I jumped Type in. Type it in the screen or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is why I jumped in and mentioned Laura's birthday right off the bat because I was afraid I'd forget. All right. That's a good idea. I'll just do it right now. Do it right now. What's Bitcoin crypto? is at $53,503.38, ladies and gentlemen. Uh. Ethereum is $2,738.24. It came back up. All right. Yeah. It's on the rise. That's right. Okay. Now, let's have a let's have a discussion about everything right. I said in the I'm last. I'm gonna look at you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna look at the damn screen. <laughs> okay. 
All right, so now we're going to go to tools found by Carlos Imegano, which is, I think, is this is the guy's brother, Florentino's brother. So after Alice Herdlicka's attack on the discoveries of Florentino Imegano, his brother, Carlos, launched a new series of investigations on the Argentine coast south of Buenos Aires. From 1912 to 1914, Carlos Imegano and his associates, working on behalf of the Natural History Museums of Buenos Aires and La Plata. Buenos Aires. Bu Buenos Aires and La Plata. La Plata? That sounds good. Discovering stone this tools in, in the uh, Pliocene, wow, Chapa, Chapad Malin, Chapad Malalin formation at the base of a barranca or a cliff extending along the <laughs> seaside at Miramar. In order to confirm the age of the implements, Carlos invited a commission of four geologists to give their opinions. These were Santiago Roth, director of the Bureau of Geology and Mines for the province of Buenos Aires, uh, Lutz Witt, a, <laughs> a geologist of the Bureau of Geology and Mines for the province, uh, yeah, same place, and Walter, Sch Walter Schiller, uh, chief of the mineral mineralogy section of the museum, and consultant to the National Bureau of Geology and Mines, and uh, Moises Cantor, the chief of the geology section of the museum. After carefully investigating the site, the commission unanimously concluded that the implements had been found in undisturbed Chapad Malalan sediments. The implements would thus be two to three million years old. While present at the site, the commission members witnessed the extraction of a stone ball and a flint knife from this Pliocene formation. They were thus able to confirm the genuineness of the discoveries. Pieces of burned earth and slag were found nearby. The commission members also reported, Digging with a pick at the same spot where the bola and knife were found, someone discovered in the presence of the commission other flat stones of the type that Indians used to make fire. What does that mean, that they used to make fire? Um, so they'll take like a... Oh, is it for... Yeah, you take like a stone that you can grind a little pit in the, okay, a little yeah. pit in the middle. <laughs> right. And then you put a your bow and your stick or whatever on there and Okay, yeah. You, you put, put a little bit of fuzz. Some shaving or shave fuzz. some fuzz down in the hole and yeah. then you that holds the bottom of the stick in place. Okay. Further discoveries of stone implements were made at the site. Uh, all of this suggests that humans capable of manufacturing tools and using fire lived in Argentina about 2 to 3 million years ago in the late Pliocene. After the commission left, uh, Carlos Imegano remained at Miramar conducting further excavations. From the top of the late Pliocene layers, Imegano extracted the femur of a toxodon, an extinct South American hoofed mammal resembling a furry, short-legged, hornless rhinoceros. Huh? Mmm, sounds tasty. <laughs> <laughs> Another way to do this is uh, to make the hole into a piece of wood. Mm. Right, you make the the little divot in a piece of wood, and then you you put the stick down in that. Yeah, and uh, Johnson taught me this. You, you can carve a little trough in the wood to that hole, and so you you put the shavings in the trough, <coughs> and while you're spinning the stick in there, it's getting hot and it's catching the uh, the shavings in the trough on fire. Mm. But of course, you end up burning up the the tool. Yeah. So a rock is another way to do it that you can you can. I think I have seen that on. I think I've seen YouTube videos of people doing that on a piece of rock with they yeah. get the little shavings in there and then they. Yeah. yeah. It's easier to use a bow, but with yeah. the, instead of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so the rhinoceros, the toxodon, Megano discovered embedded in the toxodon femur a stone arrowhead or lance point giving evidence for culturally advanced humans two to three million years ago in Argentina. Is it possible the toxodon femur with the arrowhead was a recent bone that had worked itself down from above? Carlos pointed out that the femur was found attached to all the other bones of the toxodon's rear leg. This indicated that the femur was not a loose bone that had somehow slipped into the Pliocene formation, but was part of an animal that had died when this formation was being laid down. And they have a little tiny picture here and you can kind of see where the arrowhead is bust broken off stuck in it yeah um so he, he carlos noted the bones are of a dirty whitish color characteristic of this strata and not blackish but from the magnesium uh not blackish from the magnesium oxides in the ensenadan formation 
He added that some of the hollow parts of the leg bones were filled with the uh, Chapinmalalan lus. Mm. Of course, even if the bones had worked their way in from the overlying ensenaded formation, they would still be anomalously old because the ensenaden is from one, uh, 0.4 to 1.5 million years old. Those who want to dispute the great age attri- attributed to the dox- Toxodon femur will point out that the Toxodon survived until just a few thousand years ago in South America. But Carlos Amegano reported that the Toxodon he found at Miramar, an adult specimen, was much smaller than those in the upper, more recent levels of the Argentinian stratigraphic sequence. This indicated it was a distinct older species. Carlos believed his Miramar toxodon was of the Chapadmalalan species Toxodon chapadmalensis, first identified by F. Emegano and characterized by its small size. So let me get this straight. They find a femur of an animal that's extinct. Yeah. In a layer that's millions of years old or close to two million years old. Yeah. It's the inside of the bone is filled with that same material from that layer. Yeah. And it's got an arrowhead sticking out of it. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and, and this is disputed. Yeah. Like, and it's, what? it's. <laughs> <laughs> what? It's the same color as the material. Yeah. And there's more of the leg there than just the femur. Than just the, femur the femur is what has the arrowhead in it. But the entire leg is present. God. In the material. And they're like, well, it, you know, washed down from, because the Toxodon survived until only a few thousand years ago. So it's a recent Toxodon with a recent arrowhead in it that somehow got down into this ancient sediment with the rest of the leg. Yeah. And then filled itself up with that older sediment. (laughs) Well, in order for it to get down there as a whole leg, (laughs) it couldn't have... I mean, it has to have been, it had flesh on it. I know. <laughs> That's right. So, <laughs> how is it going to get filled up with lus <laughs> if it's buried in there? Listen, man, it rhinos can't. are tough. <laughs> <laughs> this is ridiculous. Yeah. Furthermore, Carlos directly compared his Toxodon femur with femurs of Toxodon species from more recent formations and observed... The femur from Miramar is on the whole smaller and more slender. He then reported more details showing how the femur he found in the late Pliocene of Miramar differed from that of Toxodon burmesteri of more recent Pompeian levels. Carlos then described the stone point found embedded in the femur. This is a flake of quartzite obtained by percussion, a single blow and retouched along its lateral edges, but only on one surface and afterward pointed at its two extremities by the same process of retouch, giving it the form approximating a willow leaf, therefore resembling the double points of the Salutrian type. By all of these details, we can recognize that we are confronted with a point of the Mousterian type of the European Paleolithic period. So I guess the Salutrian points are part of the Mousterian groups. But this was in Argentina? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That such a point should be found in a formation dating back as much as three million years provokes serious questions about the version of human evolution presented by the modern scientific establishment, which holds that three million years ago we should find only the most primitive Australopithecines at the vanguard of the hominid line. In December of 1914, Carlos, with Carlos Bruch and Luis Maria Torres, Santiago Roth, visited Miramar to mark and photograph the exact location where the Toxodon femur had been found. Carlos stated, When we arrived at the spot of the latest discoveries and continued the excavations, we uncovered more and more intentionally worked stones, convincing us we had come upon a veritable workshop of that distant epoch. The many implements included anvils and hammer stones. Stone tools were also found in the Ensenaden formation, which overlies the Chapmalan at Miramar. I would love that. You know, you find a, a Toxodon bone with an arrowhead sticking out of it, and then you go back later, and you're like, let's keep digging there. And then you just find a whole workshop with all kinds of stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so attempts to discredit Carlos. <coughs> Carlos and Megano's views about the antiquity of humans in Argentina were challenged by Antonio Romero. In his 1918 paper, Romero made many combative remarks 
and after reading them, one might expect to find some cogent uh, geological arguments to back them up. Instead, one finds little more than some unique and fanciful views of the geological history of the Miramar coastal region. Romero claimed that all the formations in the Barranca at Miramar were recent. If you find fossils, if you find the fossils of distinct epochs in different levels of the Barranca, he wrote, that does not signif signify a succession of epochs there because the water may have elsewhere eroded very ancient fossil bearing deposits of previous epochs, depositing the older fossils at the base of the Barranca. Significantly, these same formations at Miramar have been extensively studied on several occasions by different professional geologists and paleontologists, none of, whom view, none of whom viewed them in the manner suggested by Romero. The incorrectness of Romero's interpretation of the stratigraphy at Miramar is confirmed by modern researchers who do identify the formation at the base of the cliff as Chapadmalalan and assign it to the late Pliocene, making it two to three million years old. But Romero's uh, goal is to discredit the finds. Yeah. So he's trying again to attack the geology because he can't attack the tools or the femur. Hmm. Romero also suggested that there had been massive resorting and shifting of the beds in the Barranca, making it possible that implements and animal bones from the surf from surface layers had become mixed into lower levels of the cliff. But the only facts that he could bring forward to support this conclusion were two extremely minor dislocations of strata. Some distance to the left of the spot where the commission of geologists extracted a bola stone uh, from the Chapadmalalan level of the Barranca, there is a place where a section of a layer of stones in the formation departs slightly from the, from the horizontal. This dislocation occurs near the place where the Barranca is interrupted by a large gully, as might be expected, part of the Barranca slopes down to the left at this point, but at the place where the bola stone was extracted, the horizontal stratigraphy remains intact. At another place in the Barranca, a small portion of, layer, of a layer of stones departed 16 degrees from the horizontal. So there's two places where it mm -hmm. tilts. On the basis of these two relatively inconse in inconsequential observations, Romero suggests that all the strata exposed in the Barranca had been subjected to extreme dislocations. <laughs> this would have allowed the intrusion into the lower levels of stone tools from relatively recent Indian settlements that might have existed above the cliffs. But photographs and observations of many other geologists, including Willis, it appears that the normal sequence of beds in the Barranca at Miramar was intact in locations where discoveries were made. Uh, Willis would be the Skirptar geologist that Alice heard Licka had brought with him before. So conflicting Skirptar geologists. <laughs> <laughs> In the nineteen fifty seven edition of Fossil Men, Marcellin Buell said that after the original discovery of the Toxodon femur, Carlos Omegano found in the Chapatmalalan at Miramar an intact section of a Toxodon's vertebral column or vertebral column in which two stone projectile points were embedded. He stated, these discoveries were disputed. Reliable geologists affirmed that the objects came from the upper beds, which formed the site of a uh, paradero or ancient Indian settlement, and that they were found today in the tertiary bed only as a consequence of disturbances and resortings which that bed had suffered. So here, Buell footnoted as a reference only the 1918 report by Romero. Buell did not mention the commission of four highly qualified geologists who reached a, reached a conclusion exactly the opposite of that of Romero, perhaps because they were, in his opinion, not reliable. However, having closely studied Romero's geological conclusions, particularly in light of those of Bailey Willis and other modern researchers, we are mystified that Romero should be characterized as reliable. Hmm. Buell added, the archaeological data supports this conclusion. For the same tertiary bed yielded dressed and polished stones, bolas and boladeras, identical with those used as missiles by the Indians. Buell said that Eric Bowman, an excellent ethnographer, had documented these facts. Could human beings have lived continuously in Argentina since the tertiary and not changed their technology? Why not, especially if, as certified by a commission of geologists, implements were found in situ in beds of Pliocene antiquity? The fact that these implements were identical to those used by more recent inhabitants of the same region poses no barrier to acceptance of the tertiary age. 
Modern tribal people in various parts of the world fashion stone implements indistinguishable from those recognized as having been manufactured two million years ago. Furthermore, in 1921, a fully human fossil jaw was found in the Chapad Malalan at Miramar. In his statements about the Miramar finds, Buell provides a classic case of prejudice and preconception, masquerading as scientific objectivity. In Buell's book, all evidence for a human presence in the tertiary formations of Argentina was dismissed on theoretical grounds and by ignoring crucial observations by competent scientists who happened to hold forbidden views. For example, Buell said nothing at all about the above-mentioned discovery of a human jaw in the Chapad Malalan at Miramar. Should we, thus be we should thus be extremely careful in accepting these statements one finds in famous textbooks as the final word in paleoanthropology. Scientists who disagree with controversial evidence commonly take the same approach as Buell. One mentions an exceptional discovery. One states that it was disputed for some time. Then one cites an authority, such as Romero, who supposedly settled the matter once and for all. But when one takes the time to dig up the report that, like Romero, supposedly delivered the coup de grace, it often fails to make a convincing case. Yeah. I've encountered that <laughs> plenty of times. Yep. The paper, One of the things I was the thinking paper about. that never gets read, right? It's just, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> these geologists, their job is to show up and give an opinion. Yeah, it's not science, right? But on the other hand, you know, I was thinking about Robert Shock, and it's like, well, he showed up and gave an opinion, and that I want to, I want to agree with, you know? Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of a double edged. I mean, well, you know, it depends on how much of the opinion is is has actual scientific work behind it. And then when you read into how they arrived at the opinion, if they give you their thought process, then you can sort of really go through it, you know? And like with Romero, when you actually go through his, his, his thought process, you realize, all right, so he found two little discontinuities, places where the right, strata yeah, was yeah. tilted a little bit. And then he's like, this, this is evidence of massive upheaval. Yeah. They're doing all kinds of Mental acrobatics gymnastics. to yeah. try to get to, to make it not what it what it appears to be yeah yeah whereas <laughs> with with the sphinx enclosure and shock it's the other way around yeah yeah like they do all the same stuff to make it not as old as he's saying it is right, right? yeah that's right i guess that's yeah <sighs> i don't know it yeah can, it can they, go either way you ha well you have in their minds what is like this really strong theoretical foundation that's right. And then they get to twist it around if they need to. They're, and they're like, well, this this must fit into that really strong theoretical foundation. So they'll do all kinds of gymnastics to force it to fit. Yeah, yeah. Which is the same thing with the evolutionary timeline. Yeah. Right? Like, I don't really the have... really a strong theoretical foundation in, the, in all this stuff is the evolutionary timeline. I mean, I mean... In their minds, it's the really strong theoretical foundation. You see what I'm saying? To yeah, them, yeah, yeah. To them, floating in the back, back background of all of this is this incredibly powerful theory that they think is really, really settled and that it's pretty much figured out. We just got to iron out some details. So when you find something that is really far outside of it, the same way with the Sphinx, they've got this, they've got this, inc what they feel like is an incredibly strong theoretical foundation for the entire civilization of Egypt. And and in and in other parts, this civilization, civilization, the the antiquity of the civilization of man itself, mm -hmm. right? If you find evidence that puts the Sphinx far outside of that, they can't. That that doesn't fit what they feel like is this enormously powerful yeah, the theory. Sphinx, the the Sphinx is like a is like the beginning, you know. Yeah. It's, yeah. So if you if you move that back, then it screws everything up. Right. <laughs> yeah. Not only does it screw up all of your <laughs> all of your ancient Egypt stuff, but then you have to figure out who made the Sphinx in the first place yeah. and how much did they influence ancient Egypt, and then yeah. your whole story starts to fall apart. Right. With this, it's the same thing. Some of these are so old that in order to not not just push back the uh, like advanced man, advanced advanced hominids of that period, but also move them to the Americas, like you have to, yeah, you know. So it can't be that. So they will, are willing to do all kinds of mental gymnastics. And then somebody will write a paper with all that gymnastics in it. And then later people will just reference the paper as the deciding thing and no right. one reads it. That's right. Yeah. And then when somebody like Cremo goes back and reads it, they're like, look at these crazy gymnastics. 
<laughs> this paper is actually not very good. The guy does a bunch of backflips. It doesn't prove anything. Yeah. <clears throat> but I, I, to me, it's because they have this worldview. Like, you know, I, I'm doing a bunch of hand waving that you guys can't see, all your listeners. But to me, it's like that there's this what they feel like is a very powerful. Uh, there's a par very powerful thing in the background of these kinds of arguments. And the thing in the background is the evolution of humans. And in some cases, evolution in general, because some of these finds put them so like, you know, stuff that's in the, in the, in the Eocene or the Paleocene puts it, puts it so far back that you have to start questioning, you know, the entire evolutionary process, including when did mammals even show up? you know, in the story and like advanced mammals, if you put, if you're putting like advanced hominids at 50, 50 million years ago, then you've already really, really screwed up. Not just the evolution of hominids, but mammals themselves hmm. and the arrival of advanced mammals, you know, on the scene. So it's like, there are very powerful ideas and what they feel like are strong foundational ideas at stake here. And to them, those ideas are pretty much can't be questioned. So. It doesn't make sense because it seems like it's it. And I don't know. It always seems like they're on the, the evolution theory is on the side of like making things longer. Right? You need longer periods of time for things to happen. So what is the big deal? Yeah. Why not push it back? Right. Yeah, that is a little strange. <clears throat> but the other problem is, you know, the um, the upheavals, the the cataclysms. Yeah. The... Yeah. In some cases, I wonder about these finds, and I am wondering, like, are they redeposited from enormously cataclysmic events that that's uniformitarians you, don't want to think about? That's what I'm saying. You get the geologists over there, and they're like, "Well, yeah, this was 50 million years old." <laughs> Well, <laughs> it was last week. <laughs> <laughs> so what was true of Rome, uh, Romero's report is also true of Bowman's. Buell, we have seen, advertised Bowman as an excellent ethnographer. But in examining Bowman's report, the reason for Buell's favorable judgment becomes apparent. Throughout his paper, which attacked Florentino Omegano's theories and Carlos Omegano's discoveries at Miramar, Bowman, taking the role of a dutiful disciple, regularly cited Buell as an authority. As might be expected, Bowman also quoted extensively from Herdlicka's lengthy negative critique of Florentino Omegano's work. Nevertheless, Bowman, despite his negative attitude, inadvertently manages to give some of the best possible evidence for a human presence in Argentina during the Pliocene. Bowman suspected fraud on the part of Lorenzo Parodi, a museum collector who worked for Carlos Omegano. But Bowman had no proof. Bowman himself said, I had no right to express any suspicions about him because Carlos Omegano had spoken highly of him, assuring me that he was as honest and trustworthy a man as could be found. But Bowman noted, Concerning the question of where it is possible to obtain objects for fraudulent introduction into the Chapinmalalan strata, that is a problem easily resolved. A couple of miles from the discoveries does exist a uh, paradero, an abandoned Indian settlement, exposed on the surface and relatively modern, about four or five hundred years old, where there exist many objects identical to those found in the Chapinmalalan uh, strata. So he's trying to find out if somebody's making committing fraud here. Yeah. So Bowman went on to describe his own visit to the Miramar site on November 22nd in 1920. Parodi had given a report of a stone ball uncovered by the surf and still encrusted in the barranca. Carlos invited various persons to witness its, its, its extraction, and I went there along with Dr. Esten, Esten, Estenislao, uh, ex-minister of foreign affairs, Dr. H. Von Ehring, uh, ex-director of the Museum of Sao Paulo in Brazil, and Dr. Lehman Nietzsche, well -known, the well-known anthropologist. At the Miramar Barranca, Bowman convinced himself that the geological formation earlier reported by Carlos was essentially correct. Bowman's admission confirms our assessment that the contrary views of Romero are not to be given much credibility. 
This also discredits Buell, who relied solely upon Romero in his own attempt to dismiss the discovery at Miramar of the Toxodon femur uh, and vertebrae, both with stone arrowheads embedded in them. So they not only found a femur, but also a vertebrae with arrowheads That's in cool. it. That's <laughs> cool. I would love to find something like that. Yeah. So yeah, so this guy, uh, Buell, was, quoted, was, was referencing Romero and saying Romero's evidence that the Barranca is actually just, it's actually recent stuff. Yeah. Right? And then he's also uh, referencing Bowman, saying he's an ex- excellent ethnographer and knew what he was talking about. Well, when Bowman goes out there, he looks at the Barranca and he's like, no, this is ancient shit. <laughs> 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 so it's like these people don't really pay attention to what the other people are saying, <laughs> except in one paper. <laughs> So Bowman says, when we arrived at the final point of our journey, uh, Parodi showed us a stone object encrusted in a perpendicular section of the Barranca where there was a slight concavity apparently produced by the action of waves. This object presented a visible surface only two centimeters in diameter. Parodi proceeded to remove some of the surrounding earth so it could be photographed. And at that time, it could be seen that the object was a stone ball with an equatorial groove of the kind found on bola stones. And there's a picture of it. Yeah, man. Photographs were taken of the ball in situ and the barranca and the persons present, and then the bola stone was extracted. It was so firmly situated in the hard earth that it was necessary to use sufficient force force with cutting tools in order to break it out, little by little. Bowman then confirmed the position of the bola stone, which was found in the barranca about three feet above the beach sand. Bowman stated, The barranca consists of Ensenaden above and Chapat Malalan below. The boundary between the two levels is undoubtedly a little confused. Be that as it may, it appears to me that there is no doubt that the Bola stone was found in the Chapat Malalan layers, which were compact and homogeneous. Bowman then told of another discovery. Later, at my direction, Parodi continued to attack the Barranca with a pick at the same point where the Bola stone had been discovered. And suddenly and unexpectedly, there there appeared a second ball, 10 centimeters lower than the first. It's more like a grinding stone than a bola. This tool was found at a depth of 10 centimeters from the face of the cliff. Bowman said it was worn by use. Still later, Bowman and Perotti discovered another stone ball, 200 meters from the first ones, and about half a meter lower in the Barranca. Of this last discovery at Miramar, Bowman said, there is no doubt that the ball has been rounded by the hand of man. Hmm. Wow. Altogether, the circumstances of, of discovery greatly favored a Pliocene date for the Miramar bolas. Bowman reported, Dr. Lehman Nietzsche said that according to his opinion, the stone balls we extracted were found in situ, are contemporary with the Chapin Malalan terrain, and were not introduced at any later time. Uh, Dr. Von Ehring is less categorical in this regard. Concerning myself, I can declare that I did not observe any sign that indicated a later introduction. The bolas were firmly in place in the very hard terrain that enclosed them, and there was no sign of there having been any disturbance of the earth that covered them. Bowman then artfully raised the suspicion of cheating. He suggested different ways that Perotti could have planted the stone balls, and he pounded a stone arrowhead into a toxodon femur just to show how Perotti might have accomplished (laughs) such a forgery. But in the end, Bowman himself said, In the final analysis, there undoubtedly exists no conclusive proof of fraud. On the contrary, many of the circumstances speak strongly in favor of their authenticity. It is difficult to see why Bowman should have been so skeptical of Perotti. One could argue that Perotti would not have wanted to jeopardize his secure and long-standing employment as a museum collector by manufacturing fake discoveries. In any case, the museum professionals insisted that Perotti leave any objects of human industry in place so they could be photographed, examined, and removed by experts. This procedure is superior to that employed by scientists involved in many famous discoveries that are used to uphold the currently accepted scenario of human evolution. Mm -hmm. For example, most of the Homo erectus discoveries reported by uh, von Konigswald in Java were made by native diggers who, unlike Parodi, did not leave the fossils in situ but sent them in crates to von Konigswald who often stayed in places far from the sites. Furthermore, the famous Venus of Willendorf, a Neolithic statuette from Europe, was discovered by a road workman. It is obvious that if one were to apply Bowman's extreme skepticism across the board, 
one could raise suspicions of fraud about almost every paleoanthropological discovery ever made. <laughs> Ironically, Bowman's testimony provides, even for skeptics, very strong evidence for the presence of tool-making humans in Argentina as much as three million years ago, even if, for the sake of argument, one admits that the first bola stone recovered during Bowman's visit to Miramar was planted by the collector. How can one explain the second and third finds? These were instigated not by the collector, but by Ro Bowman himself, on the spot and without any warning. Significantly, they were completely hidden from view, and Perotti did not even hint at their existence. Altogether, it appears that Buell, Romero, and Bowman have offered little to discredit the discoveries of Carlos Emegano and others at the Miramar site. In fact, Bowman gave first-class evidence that, uh, for the existence of bola makers there in the Pliocene period. Wow. It's crazy that this is just not, not known, yeah. not studied. Yep. Not, God, it's... <laughs> Why have we done this to ourselves? <laughs> <laughs> Maddening. Yeah. All right, break time? Yep. Okay. We'll be right back. Snakes. was stolen last time, ladies and gentlemen, here on Brothers of the Sermon Podcast. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Stolen. Stolen intro. So Kyle told me I could do it this time, even though now I don't have anything to say. I had a cool one <laughs> built up for last time about you not paying attention. What are you talking about? I was totally paying attention. <laughs> you were paying attention this past step, this past <laughs> But I got to say it. I got to say that you were you were counting the st stitches on your jeans or whatever it was you were doing. <laughs> Getting yeah, distracted. Wall. <laughs> I lost the watcher. Where is he at? He said he went AFK. And then what does that mean? Away from keyboard. Oh, oh, oh. Well, he's he still took there? the monitor okay, with him and he's just still left the keyboard <laughs> on. Yeah. Walked off with the monitor, but <laughs> didn't <laughs> left the keyboard there. <laughs> All right. All right, well, he, he's back. Okay. He, he Oh, yeah, he got mad we didn't do the Toxodon joke. Oh, that's what it was, that he walked off because he didn't do his Toxodon <laughs> joke? <laughs> that's what it is, yeah. <laughs> Don't ever underestimate a Toxodon's commitment to playing a practical joke. <laughs> that's how they get themselves down in that layer. Yeah. All right, uh, let's see, more bolas and similar objects. The bolas of Miramar are significant in that they point to the existence of human beings of a high level of culture during the Pliocene, and perhaps even earlier in South America. Similar implements have been found in Africa and Europe in formations of Pliocene age. In 1926, John Baxter, one of G. Reed, J. Reed Moyer's assistants, uncovered a particularly interesting object from below the Pliocene Red Crag at Bramford near Ipswich in England. Moyer did not carefully examine this object, but three years later, it attracted the attention of Henry Bruhl, who wrote, While I was staying in Ipswich with my friend, uh, J. Reed Moyer, we were examining together a drawer of objects from the base of the Red Crag at Bramford, when J. Reed showed me a singular egg-shaped object, which had been picked up on account of its unusual shape. Even at first sight, it appeared to me to present artificial striations and facets, and I therefore examined it more closely with a mineralogist's lens. This examination showed me that my first impression was fully justified and that the object had been shaped by the hand of man. Bruhl compared the object to the sling stones of New Caledonia. According to Moyer, several other archaeologists agreed with Bruhl. Sling stones and bola stones represent a level of technological sophistication universally associated with modern Homo sapiens. It may be recalled that the detritus bed below the Red Crag contains fossils and sediments from habitable land surfaces ranging from Pliocene to Eocene in age. Therefore, the Bramford Slingstone could be anywhere from 2 to 55 million years old. 
1956, J. H. R. von Konigswald described some human artifacts from the lower levels of the Olduvai Gorge site in Tanzania and Africa. These included numbers of stones that have been chipped until they were roughly spherical. Von Konigswald wrote, They are believed to be an extremely primitive form of throwing ball. Stone balls of this type, known to them as bolas, are still used by native hunters in South America. They are tied in little leather bags, and two or three of them are attached to a long cord. Holding one ball in his hand, the hunter whirls the other one, or two, around his head, and then lets fly. The objects reported by Von, Con Von Konigswald, if used in the same manner as South American bolas, imply that their makers were adept not only at stoneworking but leatherworking as well. All this becomes problematic, however, when one considers that Bed 1 at Olduvai, where the stone balls were found, is 1.7 to 2 million years old. According to standard views on human evolution, only Australopithecus and Homo habilis should have been around at that time. At present, there is not any definite evidence that Australopithecus used tools, and Homo habilis is not generally thought to have been capable of employing a technology as sophisticated as that represented by bola stones, if that is what these objects really are. So there's a, a picture here of the where the striations were mm. down the egg-shaped object to make <clears> it that shape. Once more, we find ourselves confronted with a situation that calls for an obvious but forbidden suggestion. Perhaps there were creatures of modern human capability at Olduvai during the earliest Pleistocene. Those who find this suggestion incredible will doubtlessly respond that there is no fossil evidence to support such a conclusion. In terms of evidence currently accepted, that is certainly true. But if we widen our horizons somewhat, we encounter Rex skeleton, fully human, recovered from upper bed two right at Olduvai Gorge. And not far away, at Kanam, Lewis Lakey, according to a commission of scientists, discovered a fully human jaw in early Pleistocene sediments, equivalent in age to bed one. In more recent times, human-like femurs have been discovered in East Africa in early Pleistocene contexts. These isolated femurs were originally attributed to Homo habilis, but the subsequent discovery of a relatively complete skeleton of a Homo habilis individual has shown the Homo habilis anatomy, including the femur, to be somewhat ape-like. This opens the possibility that the human-like femurs once attributed to Homo habilis might actually have belonged to anatomically modern human beings living in East Africa during the early Pleistocene. If we expand the range of our search to other parts of the world, we can multiply the number of examples of fully human fossil remains from the early Pleistocene and earlier. In this context, the bola stones of Olduvai do not seem out of place. But perhaps the objects are not bolas. To this possibility, possibility Mary Lakey replied, Although there is no direct evidence that spheroids were used as bolas, no alternative explanation has yet been put forward to account for the number of these tools and for the fact that many have been carefully and accurately shaped. If they were intended to be used merely as missiles with little chance of recovery, it seems unlikely that so much time and care would have been spent on their manufacture. Yep. Mary Lakey added, their, their use as bola stones has been strongly supported by L.S.B. Lakey and may well be correct. Lewis Lakey claimed to have found a genuine bone tool in the same level as the bola stones. Lakey said in 1960, this would appear to be some sort of uh, tool for working leather. It postulates a more evolved way of life for the makers of the Oldowan culture than most of us would have expected. Okay, relatively advanced North American finds. We shall now examine relatively advanced anomalous Paleolithic implements from North America, beginning with those found at Shegeonda in Canada on Manitoulin Island in northern Lake Huron. Many of these North American discoveries are not particularly old, but they are nonetheless significant because they give insight into the inner workings of archaeology and paleoanthropology. We have already seen how the scientific community suppresses data with uncomfortable implications for the cur currently dominant picture of human evolution. And now we shall encounter revelations of another aspect of this, the personal distress and bitterness experienced by scientists unfortunate enough to make anomalous discoveries. Between 1951 and 1955, Thomas E. Lee, an anthropologist at the National Museum of Canada, carried out excavations at Shegeonda on Manitoulin Island in Lake Huron. The upper layers of the site contained, at a depth of approximately six inches, a variety of projectile points. Lee considered these recent. Further excavation exposed implements on a layer, in a layer of glacial till. 
a deposit of stones left by receding glaciers. It thus appears that human beings had lived in the area during or before the time of the last North American glaciation, the Wisconsin. Further studies showed that there was a second layer of till, which also contained implements. Stone implements were also discovered in the layers beneath the tills. Oh, my God. How old were these tools? Three of the four geologists who studied the site thought the tools were from the last interglacial. This would make them from 75,000 to 125,000 years old. Finally, in a joint statement, all four geologists compromised on a minimum age of 30,000 years. Lee himself continued to favor an interglacial age for his implements. And these are the drawings of the points. Those are clear. Wow. Oh, yeah. One of the four original geologists, John Sanford of Wayne State University, came out later in support of Lee. He provided extensive geological evidence and arguments suggesting the Shegeonda site dated back to the uh, Sangamon Interglacial or to the St. Pierre Interstadial, a warm interlude in the earliest part of the Wisconsin glaciation. But the view advocated by Lee and Stanford and Sanford did not receive serious consideration from other scientists. Lee recalls, The site's discovery, which would be himself, was hounded from his civil service position into prolonged unemployment. Publication outlets were cut off. The evidence was misrepresented by several prominent authors among the Brahmins. The tons of artifacts vanished into storage bins of the National Museum of Canada for refusing to fire the discoverer, the director of the National Museum, who had proposed having a monograph on the site published, was himself fired and driven into exile. Official positions of prestige and power were exercised in an effort to gain control over six Shegeonda specimens that had not gone undercover, and the site has been turned into a tourist resort. All of this without the profession, in four long years, bothering to take a look when there was still time to look. Shegeonda would have forced embarrassing admissions that the Brahmins did not know everything. It would have forced the rewriting of almost every book in the business, and it had to be killed, and it was killed. Lee experienced great difficulty in getting his pu reports published. Expressing his frustrations, he wrote, A nervous or timid editor, his senses acutely attuned to the smell of danger to position, security, reputation, or censure, submits copy of a suspect paper to one or two advisors whom he considers well-placed to pass safe judgment. They read it, or perhaps only skim through it, looking for a few choice phrases that be can, can be challenged or used against the author. Their opinions were formed long in advance on the basis of what came over the grapevine or was picked up in the smoke-filled back rooms at conferences, little bits of gossip that would tell them that the writer was far out, a maverick, or an untouchable. Then, with a few cutting, unchallenged, and entirely unsupported statements, they kill the paper. The beauty and the viciousness of the system lies in the fact that they remain forever anonymous. Mm. Most of the key reports about Shegeonda were published in the Anthropo Anthropological Journal of Canada, which Lee himself founded and edited. Lee died in 1982, and the journal was then edited for a short, short time by his son, Robert E. Lee. Of course, it has not been possible for establishment scientists to completely avoid mentioning Shegeonda, but when they do, they tend to downplay, ignore, or misrepresent any evidence for an unusually great age for the site. Lee's son, Robert, wrote, Shegeonda is erroneously explained to students as an example of post-glacial post mud flow rather than Wisconsin glacial till. The original reports, however, give cogent arguments against the mudflow hypothesis. The elder Lee wrote that many geologists have stated that the deposits would definitely be called glacial till were it not for the presence of artifacts within them. <laughs> Everybody knows the mud flow is BS. <laughs> <clears throat> this has been the reaction of almost all visiting geologists. And Sanford said... Perhaps the best corroboration of these unsorted deposits as ice-laid till was the visit of some 40 or 50 geologists to the site in 1954 during the annual field trip of the Michigan Basin Geological Society. At that time, the excavation was open and the till could be seen. The sediments were presented to this group in the field as till deposits and there was no expressed dissension from the explanation. Certainly, had there been any room for doubt as to the nature of these deposits, it would have been expressed at that time. If one approach is to deny that the unsorted tooled-bearing deposits are till, another is to demand excessively high levels of proof for a human presence at the site at the designated time. 
James B. Griffin, an anthropologist at the University of Michigan, stated, There are a large number of locations in North America for which considerable antiquity has been claimed as places inhabited by early Indians. Even whole books have been published on non-sites. <coughs> Griffin included Shegeonda in the category of a non-site. Griffin said that a proper site must possess a clearly identifiable geological context with no possibility of intrusion or secondary deposition. He also insisted that a proper site must be studied by several geolog geologists expert in the particular formations present there and that there must be substantial agreement among these experts. Furthermore, there must be a range of tool forms and debris, well-preserved animal remains, pollen studies, mac macro botanical materials, human skeletal remains. Griffin also required dating by radiocarbon and other methods. By this standard, practically none of the locations where major paleoanthropological discoveries have been made would qualify as genuine sites. <laughs> For example, most of the African discoveries of Australopithecus, Homo habilis, and Homo erectus have occurred not in clearly identifiable geological contexts, but on the surface or in cave deposits, which are notoriously difficult to interpret geologically. Most of the Java Homo erectus finds also occurred on the surface in poorly specified locations. Interestingly enough, the Shegeonda site actually appears to satisfy most of Griffin's stringent requirements. Implements were found in a geological context clearer than that of many accepted, accepted sites. Several geologists experts on North American glacial deposits did apparently agree on an age in excess of 30,000 years. Evidence suggested that there was no secondary deposition or intrusion. A variety of tool types were found. Pollen studies and radiocarbon da dates were performed. And macrobotanical materials were present. <laughs> <coughs> the Shegeonda site deserves more attention than it thus far has, has received. Looking back to the time when it first became apparent to him that stone implements were being found in glacial till, T. E. Lee wrote, At this point, a wiser man would have filled the trenches and crept away into the night, saying nothing. <laughs> See? <laughs> He's explaining to you why this happens. Yeah. This is what happens. Yeah. Indeed, while visiting the site, one prominent anthropologist, after exclaiming in disbelief, You aren't finding anything down there! And being told by the foreman, the hell we aren't, get down here and look for yourself. He urged me to forget all about what was in the glacial deposits and concentrate on the more recent materials overlying them. Wow. So the anthropologist is looking down into the pit where the glacial till is exposing. He's like, you're not finding stuff in that, are you? And the foreman, who's not a scientist, he's like, yeah, we are. Come on down here. The guy's like, dude, you need to, you just need That's, to. <laughs> That's not science down there. Yeah. Down there, not that's, science. That's a lose your job. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> oh, you're finding lose your job tools. <laughs> oh, lose your job tools. <laughs> <laughs> this particular specimen is called took your job. <laughs> <coughs> Louisville and Timlin, the vendetta goes on. In 1958, at a site near Louisville in Texas, stone tools and burned animal bones were found in association with hearths. Later, as the excavation progressed, radiocarbon dates of at least 38,000 years were announced for charcoal from the hearths. Still later, a Clovis point was found. Yeah, that would have made him that a Clovis point dated at 38,000. Wow. Herbert Alexander, who was a graduate student in archaeology at the time, recalled how this sequence of finds was received. On a number of occasions, stated Alexander, the opinions voiced at that time were that the hearths were man-made and the faunal associations were valid. Once the dates were announced, however, some opinions were changed, and after the Clovis point was found, the process of picking and ignoring began in earnest. Those who had previously accepted the hearths and or faunal associations began to question their memories. So again, they've they've got this picture of what is supposed to be in the back of their minds. And they're like, yeah, these are hearths. And yeah, this, this, these animal remains, it all makes sense. Then they get the dates and they're like, wait a second. Then they find a Clovis point and they're like, okay, no. The picture in the back of their heads makes forces them to rearrange the evidence and start doing gymnastics. But before they got the dates and found that Clovis point, they were 
they were totally all agreed that those are hearths and these are animal remains and this is a human habitation site. <coughs> yeah. Finding a Clovis point in a later 38,000 years old was disturbing because orthodox anthropologists date the first Clovis point to 12,000 years, marking the entry of humans into North America. Some critics responded to the Louisville find by alleging that the Clovis point had been planted as a hoax. Others said the radiocarbon dates were wrong. After mentioning a number of similar cases of ignored or derided discoveries, Alexander recalled a suggestion that in order to decide issues of early man, we may soon require attorneys for advocacy. <laughs> it does sound like sabotage. Yeah. They're like somebody put a Clovis point down there when they, oh, yeah, well, when they realized what the <laughs> dates were. Yeah. That's a great point. The Clovis point could have been a hoax by somebody who didn't like the dates. Yeah. Just throw a beer can in there. <laughs> you know it's a modern site. That's a campfire. It's a beer can. There was some napper out here making himself a Clovis point. You know, he got his little hearth there and he drank a beer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this may not be a bad idea in the field of science like archaeology, where opinion determined the status of facts and facts resolve into networks of interpretation. See, I, I'm not sure I agree with this. Attorneys and courts may aid archaeologists in arriving more smoothly at the consensus among scholars that passes for the scientific <laughs> truth in this field. But Alexander noted that a court system requires a jury. And the first question asked of a prospective juror is, have you made up your mind on this case? <laughs> yeah. Very few archaeologists have not made up their minds on the date humans first entered North America. But yeah, we've had whole shows, well, not entire shows, but whole, practically whole segments about how courtroom stuff is not science. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But he's actually pointing out that, like, so much in archaeology is actually not science anyway. It's all opinion and interpretation. So maybe courtroom tactics could help. Uh, maybe. Don't know. I don't know what the answer is. I mean, could we, could, is it more like overwhelming finds? Like, in other words, dig deeper. Yeah. Like, th this, this stuff, again, is so old. There's a whole new generation of, of you know, anthropologists and archaeologists yeah. out there. Like the the Clovis first thing is done. Yeah. Now we're digging deeper. And yeah. perhaps in the next decade or so, we'll start finding more of this same stuff. Yeah. Because they're actually looking the for 20, it. The 20,000 year old dates. And didn't the, belong. Yeah. The 20,000 year dates and the 30,000 year dates are becoming more accepted, less fringe. Yeah. At least the 20,000 year. Like there's that bone that's in the museum here that's yeah. 22,000 years old with cut marks cut on it. Cut marks on it, yeah. And that's accepted. Pretty much. Yeah. Um, there's a few holdouts for Clovis first 15,000 years ago, but not many left. But 150,000 years, one to two million years, not going to happen. Mm, well. Because that doesn't even work in Europe. It's too old. Yeah. Well, they successfully... Uh, I don't know. It's like, I wonder, is this still happening? Like this stuff, right? That that's in this book, this compilation of these papers. Because back at, in this time, like in the early 1900s or late 1800s, they were just digging wherever and finding whatever, and be like, oh yeah, here we yeah, go. Yeah, that's cool. the question. Is like, so is it still happening now? Like, do they even bother, or is it is did they complete the destruction of that evidence? To the point that nobody even looks anymore. Yeah, I don't know. You know what I mean? Or are they still finding stuff and making papers about it that are we just don't know about? I mean, I, I don't I, Are I can't. they still finding stuff, but it's not getting published at all? Yeah, it's just not getting published. Yeah. Because at the time, like, this stuff was getting published, right? Mm hmm And they were able to arrange for groups of geologists to come out or commission scientists yes. to come look at the evidence and then those people would commission a whole team to go out and dig in the yeah, same site. Now it's just now it's just peers. Yeah. You you know, uh, uh, anonymous people just saying, "Nope. Yeah. That's not getting published." Right. So maybe it is still happening. In other words, maybe the digs are still producing finds. They're just not getting published. Yeah. And we have a friend who's been she volunteers to go on archaeological digs. And she's told me, she's like, oh, yeah, they tell you what to look for. You know, 
they already know what they're going to find basically is the idea and that that's that's not necessarily a condemnation but to me you you don't know what you're going to find that's the point right you 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 find what you find you don't say look for this and don't bother with anything else yeah the don't bother with anything else part is is yeah. bad yeah yeah I mean, I go out looking for arrowheads. Yeah. If I find a femur bone <laughs> yeah. of a toxodon, that's cool. Then I'll be mad because that's my job. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> I find the fossils. You find the arrowheads. <laughs> We've already worked this out. <laughs> okay. The idea that Clovis type projectile points represents the earliest tools in the new world is challenged by an excavation at the Timlin site in the Catskill Mountains in New York. In the mid-1970s, tools closely resembling the upper Aculean tools of Europe were found there. In the old world, Aculean tools are routinely attributed to Homo erectus, but such att attribution is uncertain because skeletal remains are usually absent at tool sites. The Catskill tools have been given an age of 70,000 years on the basis of glacial geology. All right, and now we go to the uh, Huyatlaco site. This is a very interesting case to me. Huyatlaco, Mexico. In the 1960s, sophisticated stone tools rivaling the best work of Cro-Magnon man in Europe were unearthed by uh, Juan Armenta Camacho and Cynthia Irwin Williams at Huyatlaco near Vasaquillo, 75 miles southeast of Mexico City. Valsaquillo. Stone tools of a somewhat cruder nature were found at the nearby site of El Horno. El, El Horno? I don't know how to say that one. At both the Huyatlaco and El Horno sites, the stratigraphic location of the implements does not seem to be in doubt. However, these artifacts do have a very controversial feature. A team of geologists who worked for the U.S. Ge Geological Survey gave them ages of about 250,000 years. What were they? What? The ages? 250,000 No, but years. I mean, what were they What were they dating? They were dating the strata, oh, the strata just, okay. just above the, the place where the tools were found. Okay, wow. This team, working under a grant from the National Science Foundation, consisted of Harold Mauld and Virginia Steen McIntyre, both of the U.S. Geological Survey and the late uh, Roald Frixel of Washington State University. These geologists said four different dating methods independently yielded unusually great ages for the artifacts found near Valsaquillo. The dating methods used were uranium series dating, fission track dating, tephrahydration dating, and study of mineral weathering. Hmm. As might be imagined, the date of about 250,000 years obtained for the Weatlico for Weatlico by the team of geologists provoked a great deal of controversy. If accepted, it would have revolutionized not only New World anthropology, but the whole picture of human origins. Human beings capable of making the sophisticated tools found at Weatlico are not thought to have come into existence until about 100,000 years ago in Africa. In attempting to get her team's conclusions published, Virginia Steen McIntyre experienced many social pressures and obstacles. In a note to a colleague, she stated, I had found out through backfence gossip that Hal Roald and I are considered opportunists and publicity seekers in some circles because of Weatlico, and I am still smarting from the blow. The publication of a paper by Steen McIntyre and her colleagues on Weatlico was inexplicably held up for years. The paper was first presented at an anthropological conference in 1975 and was to appear in a symposium volume. Four years later, Steen McIntyre wrote to H.J. Fulbright of the Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory, one of the editors of the for forever forthcoming book. Our joint article on the Weatlico site is a real bombshell. It would place man in the New World ten times earlier than many archaeologists would believe. Worse, the bifacial tools that were found in situ are thought to be mostly a sign of H. sapiens. According to present theory, H. sapiens had not even evolved at that time and certainly not in the New World. <laughs> Steen McIntyre continued, explaining, Archaeologists are in a considerable uproar over Weatlico. They refuse even to consider it. I've learned from secondhand sources that I'm considered by various members of the prof profession to be, one, incompetent, two, a newsmonger, three, an opportunist, four, dishonest, and five, a fool. Obviously, none of these opinions is helping my professional reputation. My only hope to clear my name is to get the Weatlico article into print so that folks can judge the evidence for themselves. 
Steen McIntyre, upon receiving no answer to this and other requests for information, withdrew the article, but her manuscript was never returned to her. A year later, Steen McIntyre wrote to Steve Porter, the editor of Quaternary Research, about having her article about Wiatlico printed. The manuscript I'd like to submit gives the geological evidence, she said. It's pretty clear cut, and if it weren't for the fact a lot of anthropology textbooks will have to be rewritten, I don't think we would have any problems getting the archaeologists to accept it. As it is, no anthro journal will touch it with a 10-foot pole. Man. So again, it comes down to, like, the geological evidence is fine, and no one would argue with it except for the presence of the tools in there. Yeah. And since they don't have good arguments against it, they just refuse to publish it. It just pisses me off. <laughs> yeah. Makes me so mad. Yeah. Steve Porter, Steve Porter wrote to Steen McIntyre, replying that he would consider the controversial article for publication. But he said he could well imagine that the objective reviews may be a bit difficult to obtain from certain archaeologists. The usual procedure in scientific publishing is for an article to be submitted to several other scientists for anonymous peer review. It is not hard to imagine how an entrenched scientific orthodoxy could manipulate this process to keep unwanted information out of scientific journals. It's just a good old boys network. You know, yeah. it's like yeah. when you're in, you're doing all the right, all, everything just right. It's like, yeah. yeah, you're in and then you're an authority. Yeah. Oh, you're a freaking scientist and whatever you say goes. Yeah. And even if you're doing like excellent science, but you're, you're not part of the network, yeah. your shit doesn't get published. You, you, yeah. Or whatever you're trying to publish doesn't fit the network's <clears throat> narrative. Narrative. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, <laughs> ugh. On March 30th in 1981, Steen McIntyre wrote to Estella Leopold, the associate editor of Quaternary Research. The problem, as I see it, is much bigger than Weatlico. It concerns the manipulation of scientific thought through the suppression of enigmatic data, data that challenges the prevailing mode of thinking. Weatlico certainly does that. Not being an anthropologist, I didn't realize the full significance of our dates back in 1973, nor how deeply woven into our thought the current theory of human evolution had become. Our work at Weatlico has been rejected by most archaeologists because it contradicts that theory, period. Their reasoning is circular. H. Sapiens sapiens evolved circa 30,000 to 50,000 years ago in Eurasia. Therefore, any H. Sapiens sapiens tools 250,000 years old found in Mexico are impossible because H. Sapiens sapiens evolved circa 30,000, etc., etc., etc. Such thinking makes for self-satisfied archaeologists, but for lousy science. Yeah. Eventually, Quaternary Research published an article by Virginia Steen McIntyre, by Roald Frixel, and Harold E. Mauld. It upheld an age of 250,000 years for the Weatlico site. Of course, it is always possible to raise objections to archaeological dates, and Cynthia Irwin Williams did so in a letter responding to Steen McIntyre, Frixel, and Mauld. Her objections were answered point for point in a counter, counter letter by Mauld and Steen McIntyre, but Irwin, Irwin Williams did not relent. She <laughs> and the American archaeological community in general have continued to reject the dating of Weatlico carried out by Steen McIntyre and her colleagues. So <coughs> uh, Cynthia Irwin Williams was the head archaeologist on that site. She was mad at the dates that the geologists gave her. <laughs> and then she didn't want them to publish their paper. And then when Steen McIntyre and, their, and the other geologists finally got their paper published in quaternary research, and she, a, starts a, she, she got mad because she's like, you're, you're discrediting my own site, right? With all of my colleagues. Wow. The anomalous findings at Weatlico resulted in personal abuse and professional penalties, including withholding of funds and loss of jobs, facilities, and reputation for Virginia Steen McIntyre. Her case opens a rare window into the actual social processes of data suppression and paleoanthropology, processes that involve a great deal of conflict and hurt. A final note. We ourselves tried to secure permission to reproduce photographs of the Weatlico artifacts in a publication, and we were informed that permission would be denied if we intended to mention the lunatic fringe date of 250,000 years. <laughs> 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 date. <laughs> 
How old do you think this is? Well, I think it dates back about around... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's early to took our job period. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's something, yeah. something in there. Yeah, it's the between the took your job and lost your funds period. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> plus or minus, plus or minus a few points of reputation. Yeah. All right. I think that's it for this week. Well, thanks. Yeah. I know it's, some uh, of it's frustrating. Yeah, it is. That's why we got it. We got to air it out on the podcast, you know. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, Watcher. Yeah, thanks, Watcher. And you guys can get a hold of us, brothers of the serpent at gmail.com. Check out the website, brothers of the for all the podcast related stuff, including the encyclopedia, the glossary of terms, the merchandise store, which is what we call the snake skins, and uh, join the pyramid scheme through your Patreon or PayPal. And we probably should have some other payment methods in there. There's a whole bunch of other ones. I'd love to be able to be able to send us Bitcoin. Oh yeah, that would be great. Uh, just just one. <laughs> that's enough. That's all we need. <laughs> just one Bitcoin. <laughs> and uh, thanks to Jeff who runs the Discord and the Library of the Serpent. Uh, join the Facebook group if you uh, if you're on Facebook. There is a there is a Brothers of the Serpent podcast Facebook group. We're not in there, but there's lots of people in there, and they do share stuff. Uh, and yeah, if you want to join the Discord, there are links to it on the website. And uh, yeah, thanks to all you guys out there, including uh, the podcast Word of the Road Go and Uncharted X. And we're going to be hanging out with Ben in a couple of days. That's, That's gonna right. Be great. Yeah. Going to be able to meet him. So that'll be really cool. And of course, thanks to all of you listeners out there. Yep. We love you guys. Always have. Always will. Good night, Adamu. Won't see you next week. Get back to work. Yeah, unless they take the job. Mm-hmm.